discussion of uh, uh, District 3 seats <laughs> and the plan uh, for that. So uh, we'll put that on for later. Uh, so any other changes to the agenda that folks have? Um, otherwise, it is a very full, I'll say this, it's a very full agenda and <laughs> not uh, calling any one item out, I guess I would say to all of us who are here and online, uh, my recommendation is just please be conscious of your airtime and, um, you know, but having said that, do say what needs to be said. Um, but uh, we are, I am hoping to get through everything this evening. Uh, okay, uh, any other changes to the agenda? Okay, uh, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, if you would say your name, um, where you live, and try to keep your comments to about two minutes or less, that would be great. Uh, and that is true for anyone who is uh, addressing the council on any other topic later this evening. Um, one other thing that I want to say about this, though, when we get to the item on um, the uh, encampment policy, um, one of the things that happened in the last round of conversation about this policy is we had a lot of conversation, too, about what could be done uh, to address homelessness in general. And that is welcome that's great we want to hear that uh, but I, I would encourage folks if you have comments to make that are addressing homelessness generally um, that you do it during general business and appearances so that the item around the uh, encampment policy can be focused around just that policy uh, that's my my encouragement uh, to you if, um, if I may on that. Yes, matter, sure, yes. Is, is we did invite Commissioner Brown from the state to talk about the home yes. general homelessness issue. So Sorry. I hope that that part Oh, yes, no, welcome. absolutely. That is a part of that. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's a good point. Maybe <laughs> maybe it's okay if it if it blends together. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, no problem. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so general business and appearances. Anyone wish to address the council? Uh, Parklet sidewalk obstruction. Do you want to introduce yourself? Whitaker, uh, when you were adopting the revised Parklet's ordinance, um, I raised the issue of use of those that is public spaces at the times when the businesses were closed, and it was ambiguous. Um, most of them do, but several of them, Three Penny puts a chain across it, I removed the chain. Uh, the, but the, uh, Julio's is actually blockading with tables and chairs, blockading any access. And separately, that's not a parklet. That, that was not taking parking places, that took a fire lane. So I don't know that the ordinance gave Bill the authority to forfeit a fire lane for uh, a restaurant's use, but that's what happened. The truck drivers aren't happy about it at all. Uh, that's something that needs attention. Um, truck access to the rear of uh, French's block continues to be a problem. We're headed into winter. A letter was sent by the Aubuchon's manager to Public Works. Um, the solution is to remove a few parking places over near Positive Pie so that the trucks can come in via the new road and exit via the alley next to Charlie Ellison, between Charlie Ellison and Ravel Rouse. That's all detailed in a letter, ask it Donna for it. Um, Taylor Street, uh, oh, Ta Taylor Street was just paved last year and we've got big, huge puddles. It, it was not graded properly to the drains. So I was Saturday walking in the rain after the farmers, during the farmer's market. And if that paving job is still under warranty, you need to invoke that warranty and get it paved where it drains to the storm drain. Um, five or six years now, I've been talking about the drainage in the crosswalks that freezes and turns to ice. Uh, it's 
disheartening that nothing gets done again and again and again, especially while we have paving money and shimming uh, and ARPA money. Now would be the time to do some of that. Um, maybe some ADA issues related to our uh, condition of our sidewalks. Power wash of Girton Park. Uh, I spent the last month and a half asking, watching everybody point at somebody else about whose job it is to maintain the vegetation along the bike. Power wash Girton Park. Park. Parks doesn't want to do it. Public Works doesn't want to do it. And it's a, when you got flies nesting on human waste and, and that are also landing on the food that's being delivered there, you, you've got a health hazard. The fire chief said weeks ago that it should be closed or clean. No one has taken action on it. So uh, I point that out of the lethargy. Um, the homelessness task force hasn't done anything for two and a half years. The get new get off the pot committee is now losing its champion member. Uh, how about just enforcing the lease that requires that the transit center's bathrooms be open from eight to six every day? You know, I, I asked for the lease this week. We've spent all this jaw time about it and compiled a list of bathrooms, but why didn't we just look at the lease and realize that they're violating it by not keeping those bathrooms open? Not that that's sufficient, but that's a, a small and easy start. Um, Mount Peter's America's most mismanaged small town capital. Thank you, Stephen. And I see that there are hands um, from Peter uh, Kellerman and Morgan Brown. Peter, go ahead. Okay, um, I'll try to be uh, quick about this. Uh, given uh, what your earlier comments. Um, I'd just like to just talk very briefly about clear and timely communication between city government and Montpelier residents. And I've, I've talked about this before, and I am very aware of all the things that the city manager and the city council do to keep residents informed. But unfortunately, too many residents uh, fall between the cracks and don't learn about matters that may affect them in a timely fashion. And this has many, there are many reasons for it. You know, Times Argus doesn't come out every day anymore, et cetera. And I'm, I'm gonna skip over all the reasons for it. Um, but recently, uh, as a resident of um, uh, District 3, um, and also uh, specifically Mount, Mountain View Street, um, I recently learned about two matters that you know, you know, affect me, and as it being the can coordinator, they have, I know they affect our our whole community here. Um, and the, these these, but not very clearly, not very defined. Uh, those two issues, you've already alluded to one of them, is Dan Richardson leaving, and the fact that a week from today you're scheduled to appoint uh, a uh, a replacement, which would who would be in place until next March at which point he or she would probably run for office and probably be elected. This is not quite a democratic process, especially not if if we find out about it, uh, you know, it, it, it so, happens so fast and we find out about it late. Not that it isn't posted some places, but if I, you don't do Facebook and you don't look at front porch. Uh, it's hard to find. I mean, it was nearly impossible to find that fact. Um, there is the, uh, uh, the production company possibility, another large apartment complex, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Brown uh, property. Again, I, I, I never knew, even though I, I'm the, the CAN coordinator, I didn't find out that there had been a public presentation, sort of a public presentation, back last May. Turns out only abutters were informed about this, which isn't really a requirement since this was, they haven't even officially proposed this to the um, a, a design, uh, the development review board. But I've been trying to get both to come and do a presentation to the community that, that, that this, um, uh, would be in, and not only have I not heard from them, but my attempts to get information about this and urge 
the uh, planning department to do this have um, not been received uh, um, positively. I really think that the city council and the, and the city manager need to make communications a priority in this new age that we live in, an age of COVID when people are isolated, they don't to go to work, people don't read the newspaper, people don't go to church as much anymore. There just is, we've got to come up with better ways to so that people really know about this. I have some specific suggestions, but and starting with the website, the city website is, I'm sorry, it's a disgrace to not be able to find the information about Dan leaving and, 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 and what the stages are for appointment anywhere on that website is really, uh, is it, unacceptable. Not only that, there's information on it that is old and wrong, that it should be, you can't find, you can't even find the most recent minutes from city council meetings. You find the ones from the week, the time before. And the second thing is, there should be a notification system in place like the state has that people can opt in for and opt out. As a coordinator college uh, street area, I uh, asked questions to everybody in my neighborhood. Do you want to find out about, about this, 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 and this? I really went out to say, so that people would not be bombarded by information. About, but would get the information that they do care about. And this, something like that needs to be set up, maybe the way that expertise or the money to get a, a education system, it would be through CAN, use CAN as a way of getting information out to neighbors. I could information out about the process in, you know, in half a day if I had been uh, uh, informed about it. If I'd been informed about the bow thing back last April before it happened, I could have had our whole community out there. Use the, use the volunteer resources that you have, but make communication a priority. We've had some horrible things happen in town, which if there had been better communication from the get-go, I think would have had a much more salutary resolution. I'm sorry I took um, thank you, Peter. And just as a FYI, we will be discussing the process for um, the appointment for Councilman Richard uh, Richardson's seat uh, later this evening. And um, the minutes should be available. I'm happy to um, to check in with you about where to find them or how to find them. Did, John, did you look into that they're available? Uh, yeah, they're available. Uh, Peter, if, if there's ever a problem like that, please give me a call. Um, I mean, it, I'm pretty easy to find. And yeah, I, you know, mm. I, I recognize you'll probably say you shouldn't have to give me a call, but you know, sometimes you got to give me a call. Um, now, a lot of times what you'll get is the raw notes because I have to have those up by five, uh, five days and they won't be complete. And in fact, you'll find tonight we're having to bump the minutes for approval because of something I couldn't get confirmed, but they're up there. At least they look like they're up there to me now. Um, also, just having said that, though, thank you. Uh, your point is nonetheless very well taken. That communication needs to be a high priority for us. Um, Morgan. Um, the problem uh, that I was going to bring to your attention has since been resolved. There was a real bad echo feedback loop there on you for those of us watching on YouTube. But I just checked the vol volume and it's fine now. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, anyone else? Okay. All right. We're going to move on then to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion or amendments regarding the consent agenda? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda without the minutes for the July 21st, 2020 meeting. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, so uh, the consent agenda passes. Um, all right, so we are up to item five, uh, the appointment to the Development Review Board. 
And for this, we have um, one applicant, Catherine Burgess. And uh, Catherine, oh, you're here. Wonderful. Would you be up for coming up to the, the table up here and introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your interest in serving on the Development Review Board? Oh, uh, right, yeah, the center table. Yeah. Just that seat. Yeah. So the There's uh, the mic. Or the mic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi there, is that working for yes. hybrid audience? My name is Catherine Burgess, and I'm really excited to be <laughs> applying for the Development Review Board. I'm an urban planner by background, and I work nationally in national policy. So part of my focus has been smart growth and climate resilience. And I moved to Montpelier in the last year. And so I see the Development Review Board as an exciting opportunity to both get to know the community better and to give back. And so I'm, I'm very excited about the prospect of serving on the board and uh, having the chance to um, do that hands-on work. A lot of the work that I do now involves like technical assistance of cities across the country. And um, I'm looking forward to both sharing those national lessons and then learning from the folks who are already serving on the board about the policy background and precedence here. So. Any questions for Catherine? Is there a motion? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I move pursuant to 1 BSA 313A3 that we enter executive the session to discuss the appointment of a public officer. I'll second. Okay, motion and second. Uh, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so we will be right back. All right, and Donna, I'm, I'm just going to call you. Is that okay? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Second. All in favor? Please. Aye. Aye. Okay, and opposed? Okay. Um, so we are back in regular session. And where is that? I move that we appoint Catherine Burgess to the Development Review Board. Second. Oh, okay, right. motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. We are so uh, delighted that you are willing to step up and serve uh, on this committee. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are up to um, the homeless, homelessness um, state policy as well as the encampment policy. Uh, so just to clarify how this time will go. Uh, we've got a lot of folks online here. Um, so uh, we do have, um, uh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Brown, Sean Brown. <laughs> Commissioner Brown here. And thanks um, for coming in person. We'd heard yep. you were Zooming. So. Yeah. From the Agency of Human Services um, and uh, to talk about the um, state's perspective. And uh, then we, I, I know folks probably would like to speak to this and uh, but I think the way I, we're going to structure this is I'd like for uh, Commissioner Brown to go first. Um, and then if we have questions um, uh, for uh, the commissioner, then that would be the time to do that. Um, then I'd like to hear from the public specifically um, and uh, any, any thoughts or comments uh, that, that folks would like to raise. We'll start with people who are here. And then we'll go to uh, folks who are virtual, and then um, and then we'll have a discussion as to how we want to move forward. <clears throat> All right. So um, with that, Commissioner Anne, Sean. can I have a comment first? Oh, for sure. Go ahead, Donna. Uh, uh, you said that Sean was there. Is there any way to give a, a computer so that they can Sean can talk right into the computer and be part of the remote screen? Otherwise, we don't see and hear very good. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he's. Um, can you see okay. him now? Right next to you. Is he on the remote screen? Um, Morgan Brown Council. If the maybe if the council chambers video were turned on. Curious. Do you see him? Yeah, he's there. Yeah. Okay, he's there. Okay. Beautiful. Sorry. Thank you. 
Uh, Not the video, though. The video isn't there. The video yeah, is there. Conference room. He's listed as manager's oh. conference room. So. Okay, that's much better than before. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure, uh, for the council, uh, my name is Sean Brown, the commissioner for the Vermont oh. Department for Children and Families. Oh. You need to get the right, oh, right, oh, right, right up, up to you. Okay. Yeah. I'm the Commissioner for the Vermont Department for Children and Families. With me today as well online on Zoom is Sarah Phillips, who's the Director of our Office of Economic Opportunity, and so she'll be joining in and providing information and answering questions as well. Um, one of the programs that we run at the department is the Emergency Housing Program. Um, it's been in existence for, for many decades. Um, historically, it's had some very restrictive eligibility criteria of who it served and for how long they were served. Um, with a motel voucher. Um, as, as probably most of you know, at the start of the pandemic, um, when it became clear that those um, in congregate settings um, and also um, with underlying health conditions were particularly vulnerable um, in the stay home, stay safe, um, the state moved very quickly to um, open up the program um, and relax the eligibility criteria at any homeless household or individual in the state was eligible uh, for as long as we had relaxed those restrictions. <clears throat> and so a program that on any given night uh, prior to the pandemic, um, at the peak of, of when we served households during the winter, um, we might have served 200 to 250 households. Um, at its peak during the pandemic, served over 2,000 households. Um, that was this past, early this past April. I think our peak was 2,008 households on around April 8th. Um, so a, a very expanded program. We were able to meet that need during the pandemic, given um, you know the governor's um, you know basically shut down the economy and tourism, and so motels were given the option to stay open to serve um, two um, uh, emergency uh, first responders or essential workers or. Um, those receiving assistance through the general assistance program. And so um, many hotels chose to work with us that hadn't worked with us in the past. Um, many others chose not to. And so that's how we were able to meet the need. Um, this legislative session, the legislature asked the department to form a work group to kind of start thinking about what the program would look like in state fiscal year 22 as as we thought the pandemic was winding down and vaccines were becoming available and it looked like there was a, a light at the end of the tunnel um, we put together a, a work group that uh, homeless providers from around the state um, representatives from um, vermont legal aid also um, domestic uh, violence organizations as well um, and and came up with a proposal that was submitted to the legislature that um, reimposed some eligibility criteria, but was much more expanded than existed prior to the pandemic. Um, those rules went into effect um, for new applicants on June 1st and for households that were in the program at the end of May were subject to those new eligibility um, criteria um, on July 1st. We are currently serving 936 households across the state um, this morning in the central Vermont district, which we call uh, the Barry district, but would include Montpelier. Um, we are now in, in this area serving 119 um, homeless households and motels across the state. That's 140 adults and 43 children. With that, we also fund um, a wide variety of services um, through uh, Sarah Phillips office um, uh, through the housing opportunity program. And I can help have her uh, jump in right here just kind of explain on those sound on um, his computers and some feedback so you, there's anything you're doing sorry sorry <laughs> we're all learning new tricks so let's let's see i was that going to are you available to jump in okay yeah no that's good you're not feeding back now okay yeah good That would be Sarah's audio. Oh, it was Sarah's audio. Well, I mean, in order to hear Sarah. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Oh, curious. You can hear me. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
probably be all right. Yeah. So there's an empty seat up there on the, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, should that should not feed back. <laughs> Interesting work there. Here, here, Sarah. Yes, can you? Yeah, I can go ahead and jump oh. in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was hearing Sarah a little bit. Uh, Sarah, if you can keep keep talking. Okay, sure, yeah, I'll keep going. So, right, so I'm Sarah Phillips. I'm the director at the State Office of Economic Opportunity. And uh, Sean mentioned we administer grant programs that support um, organizations organizations in the area that are working to address homelessness so that includes uh, Meriden Haven to operate emergency shelter and provide services it also includes Capstone Community Action which um, provides some uh, housing to uh, folks as well as case management support to help people get into housing it includes um, Circle the domestic violence shelter uh, it also includes a program at the Family Center of Washington County, which uh, helps to rehouse families experiencing homelessness and uh, help keep them housed over the long term. So, um, so in this past year, we actually made a pretty significant new investment to uh, increase bed capacity in the central Vermont area, emergency shelter beds, uh, and also increase some of the um, supportive services that folks uh, um, received to stay in housing as well. So it's about a 35% increase in funding this past year in Central Vermont represents about $1.2 million under um, the Housing Opportunity Grant Program and $1.5 million if we include the family centers uh, work as well. So that's that's pretty significant new investment and that's part of what we're doing is making sure that there's enough services um, uh, folks boots on the ground out there to help people um, search and find housing, help them to address their barriers to housing and access all of the financial resources they need to get into housing. Um, and then also services to help people um, once they're in housing so they can keep that housing and get connected to other services that that household might need like mental health or substance use support services or other other help with workforce develop, um, with employment or training. So I'm happy to speak to it more, but that's a general overview. Great, Jump, jump in um, um, as, we were as, as we were asked to start um, imposing the new eligibility criteria um, um, in June and July, we recognize that housing is incredibly challenging uh, to find right now the real estate market and the rental market have experienced um, conditions that I don't think anyone expected we would see in the pandemic with many people coming into Vermont um, and um, uh, leasing up a lot of the apartments and buying real estate at, at astronomical prices. It's putting a lot of pressure across the housing system in Vermont um, and it's really making it challenging for homeless households to locate an apartment or, or to purchase a house um, to help ease the transition. Um, for households that were no longer eligible um, in July that were participating in the program, um, we provided um, a, a, what we termed an essential payment to households of $2,500 um, to help them transition out either to reestablish connections with family or friends um, or, or, and to help meet their needs um, in the months ahead. Also, we established um, uh, uh, funds for our housing partners to, to access to serve households which we deemed rapid resolution funds and each household was eligible for up to eight thousand dollars to help with transition cost um, or you know if they located a place to live for, for like security deposits rent um, you utility deposits and whatnot and so those funds have been available to support households as well uh, you know and then also as I indicated we're continuing to house about 936 households across the state um, motel capacity is a challenge for us right now with the tourism really picking up and Vermont being recognized as a leader in the nation um, as a relatively safe uh, state to be right now during the pandemic um, we have seen motel capacity restrict considerably um, and in many areas of the state, we run out of motel rooms on a regular basis and need to kind of coordinate how, how we serve people and m move people from district to district if necessary. Um, so, it, and we predict that the motel capacity 
um, will continue to further restrict as we get into the foliage season, d depending on where the pandem pandemic um, progresses to or, or, or moves to in the coming months. But also the other piece I would add is that um, we've for the last many years, we've had a policy called the adverse weather where, uh, where we relax the rules of certain weather conditions are met and we still um, intend to um, have that policy in place this winter. And so it's essentially when the weather or, or with precipitation meets a certain uh, criteria, uh, we relax the rules and anyone who's homeless is eligible for housing. And in most winters, that's around 155 nights from around November and through the end of March that that condition is met. Um, we are nervous about the capacity of motels um, and we've experienced that prior to the pandemic, particularly on, on, on big holiday ski weekends in certain areas of the state. And so uh, how we've addressed that in the past and we're looking to do that this year um, <laughs> is we partner with local uh, housing providers to stand up emergency uh, warming shelters that will open up um, when we run out of capacity and the weather gets incredibly um, cold and dangerous. Um, and so we anticipate we'll be doing that as well. Um, historically, uh, for several years, we funded um, one of the shel uh, um, cold weather shelters that opened up in Montpelier. I think it was in the basement of the Bethany Church. Um, that ha that didn't operate last year. And my understanding is it's not planning to, to, to open this year. But we do know with um, the legislature with the, with, at the governor's request, appropriated about $110 million for new housing projects across the state. Ten million of that was for shelter expansion. Um, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board is the organization that is um, spearheading the, the request for proposals and, and, and the team that's reviewing those and approving those. Um, and we do know that three projects are being funded in, in this area now. Uh, the Twin City Motel um, is going to be purchased by, by the Good Samaritan Haven and turned into a, a year-round shelter with 35 beds. Also, um, they're working with Down Street in, in South Barry uh, to purchase what was uh, the Phoenix House, and that will be 15 units of uh, transitional housing. And then also uh, Down Street, um, some apartments up in Berlin um, are as well. And so those um, commitments have been made financially, and, and we have committed to funding the services um, for uh, the Good Sam to run the Phoenix House and uh, the Twin City. And so th those resources will be in place. We believe the time frame for the Twin City project to open up um, is in January um, of, of uh, this coming January. Um, and so that, that's a lot of the work that's happening right now. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. Obviously, we, would, we, we are um, uh, thankful for the invitation to be here today. Um, this is an important topic for us. And I think that, you know, if there is um, uh, something that has come positive out, out of, of the pandemic, it's that um, uh, it has really spotlighted the issue of homelessness, which has really been um, a problem for, for, for many years in Vermont, but has become particularly acute during the pandemic. And so uh, we uh, value the opportunity to be here and having the conversation. We want to partner with the city um, if you have any ideas for new projects or that you want to for affordable housing or um, uh, any shelters, we, you know, we certainly are available to, to, to work with the city. So uh, questions for the commissioner, uh, go ahead. Sure, uh, commissioner, thank you so much for coming and I appreciate um, the information you've given. Um, a couple of questions, when you use the word affordable housing, is there a particular definition that you're have in mind I would defer to a phone a friend, Sarah Phillips. Because, <laughs> um, nope. Oh, so we can't hear you now. No, Hang no. on, oh, hold on one now. second. Okay. Go ahead. So there are a lot of ways to define affordable housing. Generally, it's it's a it's a general term when we talk about affordable housing development to think about. Um, uh, subsidizing uh, with capital dollars the construction of new housing that then in various ways is made affordable to um, households with low incomes. Um, uh, so that happens in different ways um, through tax credit financing or by capping the uh, total amount of rent that can be charged in those units. But more generally, the term affordable housing refers to an understanding that um, people should be, households should be paying them more than 
uh, 30% of their income towards their housing costs. So you can achieve that by uh, supporting the development of housing with capital dollars. Um, you can also achieve that with rental assistance, right, which helps decrease um, the amount of uh, rent that a household has to pay for market-based housing. Well, and, and to that point, the affordable housing that you're proposing for Central Vermont, what, what types are those? Uh, you know, are we envisioning, are you envisioning rental units in which there would be subsidies, or are we talking about potential expansion and building of houses that people would eventually purchase and own and reside in? I mean, obviously, everybody resides in the houses at the end <laughs> of the day, but, you know, I'm, I'm just curious. Just because uh, affordable housing is, as you just described, it's pretty runs a pretty wide gamut of of possibilities for everything from subsidized rental relationships to um, you know tax supported um, building and ownership. And so I'm just curious what what in this area is is in your mind is being proposed. Yeah, and that the tax credit program is what I was referring to, the low income housing tax credit program. So um, we, so there is a range of rental assistance that is already available in the central Vermont area through the Vermont Emergency Rental Assistance Program. There are new emergency housing vouchers through the State Housing Authority. Um, there's also other rental assistance that's been made available to folks experiencing homelessness um, to the level where you might say that anyone who needs rental assistance at this moment of time and is experiencing homelessness can can probably access that. I think our bigger challenge right now is the lack of available units, right? The lack of available places for people to go. Um, and so sometimes, um, so that the, um, and I would defer to Downstreet for to follow up, and I'm happy to follow up with them and send back information to the to you all. But um, the property up in Berlin, for instance, probably includes a range of funding. Um, resources to make that housing affordable from both um, what's called tax credit units, which um, limit uh, or which are our rents are set such a way that folks have 60 percent um, or 80 percent of median income can afford them to other units that might have what's called a project-based voucher or a housing voucher that's in the unit that sort of caps the amount of rent a particular household has to pay based on their income. So it's, it's, it's complex. <laughs> I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I don't know about that specific project. I can say that the Twin City project and the Phoenix House project are both what we would call emergency shelter projects. So folks staying there don't have a lease, they aren't paying rent, they're staying there because they're experiencing homelessness and a Good Samaritan would be helping them to access rental assistance and find a unit. Sure. So, so the project that will be at the, um, the, the new proposed town center up in Berlin, Will have 30, 30 units, and six of those units will be set aside to serve families that were homeless, mm -hmm. and they will come with rental assistance attached to them. What's the time frame on that project? Um, I I know it was just approved. I I I don't know the exact time frame. We could get that for you, but then uh, that was just a, funding was just approved for that project by VHCP. <clears throat> Other questions? Uh, sorry, just had sure. one more follow up, um, which is, um, you know, going then to the issue of shelters, um, what, what is the anticipated gap between, um, you know, we, we're, what we're hearing is that there's a growing number of homeless in the area um, that currently are exceeding the shelter capacity, the current shelter capacity, and you're indicating that there's at least two shelters coming online, the Twin City Project as well as the Phoenix House. Um, what are you anticipating for a gap between the demand and, and supply in the shelter system? Between the, the 15 transitional housing, and I believe it's 35, that, that will be 50. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there still is an unmet need, but whether that that will be for families or for single adult households, you know, it, it, it can vary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we will... Um, during the winter months, you know, have the adverse weather policy and, you know, but motel capacity is one of the limiting factors there as well. Um, and so uh, we, we do predict that there could be a shortage. I don't have the exact number here, but, but um, 
and I would say that that existed prior to the pandemic as well. Sure. I wouldn't say that that it's a growing problem. It's a continuing problem. Sure. But I know, um, and the reason I ask these questions in part is because, you know, one of the legal issues behind any camping policy is our capacity to provide alternative shelters. And so, you know, I think one of the judgments we have to make, and it's very helpful to have this information, um, is just, you know, what type of unmet need are we anticipating in the community over the next year or two, um, you know, as these shelters start to come online versus the, you know, the other news that we're receiving that this population's grown in the post-pandemic world. I mean, we, we hope, I mean, our goal is to make sure that everyone um, has a safe place to be mm -hmm. where that was the, the, what was the driving behind the policy of the adverse weather. And so, you know, we continue to work, uh, you know, with local establishments to, to engage them, to have them become a part of the motel program. Some of them chose to shift back to serving tourists. Um, if the demand softens in the winter, our, our hope is, is that those hotels will come back online to serve the homeless. And so that would be our first focus is try to increase the motel capacity to meet that immediate need. Um, and then if, if that is not, uh, those are not available, then we would turn to, you know, what type of emergency shelters could we stand up with a homeless, you know, um, we use different models. We used one in a church in Burlington, we used one in a, in a local um, organization in Rutland in the past. And so those are the areas we would look to. And if we saw an area of unmet need in Montpelier, we would probably have a conversation with the city and a provider about, is there a location where, you know, we could help, you know, uh, bring in an organization to stand this up and operate it. Um, you know, that, that's the planning we do during during the summer and the fall is start thinking about what organizations we can partner with, put, put a grant agreements in place to staff and support those and make sure we have supplies. We've worked with the Red Cross to make sure we can bring cots in and they're available in a trailer on a moment's notice to be brought in and other supplies as well. And so that's the work that, that that's going on to make sure that that um, we meet the the, the, meet, the the need during the winter months. That's always our concern to make sure people have a safe warm place to go during the winter. Connor, did you have questions? Go ahead. I think uh, Councilor Bate keeps some snacks in our commissioner. They're a bit broad. I was hoping you could just talk about what you think the state sees as the city's responsibility to make sure uh, this population's needs are met. You know, like we feel like we've done a lot. You know, we've embedded a social worker in the police department. Mm -hmm. uh, we put money towards Dawn, who's our homeless liaison. She's great, but it's still just not nearly enough, you know? And I'm on the homelessness task force mm -hmm. and there's no shortage of ideas, right? Like we're thinking, okay, tiny house village, uh, you know, warming day shelter. We're thinking like permanent, like public bathrooms in town that can have showers, washing facilities. Are these the type of projects you think we could partner with the state on to maybe get the appropriations bill in the next year? It's yes, and there, there are resources now available. I mean, there's, um, uh, you know, the BHCB is um, reviewing a, another round of proposals to issue out new funding. And so there's still, and, and hopefully there'll be more dollars allocated, um, particularly if you have a project that you want to move forward, we would love to partner with you and support you in that. And I think those are exactly the conversations you should be having as a community. We don't look at it as it's the city's responsibility or it's this responsibility. It's all of our responsibility. And you know, when we bring the resources we have to bear to the conversation and the technical expertise to support providers and communities, Sarah's um, office does a lot of technical assistance with uh, shelter providers. Um, particularly if they're, if they're starting up a new program, uh, they have a lot of experience and technical knowledge in that areas as well. And that's what we're willing to share mm. in this. Um, this problem has been decades in the making and it's not gonna be solved overnight. But um, you know, I've, I've been in state government a long time and, and um, I'll have to say um, for once, financial resources are not the limiting factor that, that um, are, are, are hindering our efforts. Um, I think it's, um, our, our, our partners are struggling with staffing. Um, you know, the availability of real estate is really strained right now. And so those are more of the limiting factors that, that we're trying to get creative with right now. Um, 
And so any ideas that the council or the city has, we're willing to partner with you and try to move those forward and, and champion those. Right. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, Anne, can I ask a question? It's Donna. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Uh, uh, Sean, I'm a city council member who's remote, but thank you for being here. And Sarah, so much good information. Can you help me on the process? If we come up with some little tiny village structured community or a community gathering place with shower and bathrooms, can we come to you directly and get funding or do we have to get in a queue for a grant? I would say there's not, well, right now the money's been allocated to BHCB. And so I know Sarah's um, uh, staff have been supporting um, communities and providers who have, have ideas to help them formulate those and put them into a proposal to be spent at the VHCB. But we've also um, have a history of taking um, community specific projects to the legislature and seeking funding. Um, that's how we actually funded some of the work in, in um, Montpelier and in some proposals um, in Rutland is that's where we were several years ago, we were seeing a critical need. And so the legislature earmarked um, in the budget process, dollars for those for projects in, in uh, the central Vermont and the Rutland community. And so that's always an avenue as well. So I think the, uh, you know, you, I would encourage you if you have a project, let, let's connect or, or, you know, we can, we can help provide technical expertise on that. And then we can figure out the best way to, to move it forward as quickly as possible. Do you have a card that we could take? <laughs> we, know how to reach. we know how to reach you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, just check. If I can, oh, can I add something to that, Sean? Would it sure. be all right? Sure. Say that if there's a project that's a homeless assistance project specifically, we definitely look to see that those projects are a part of what we call the homeless continuum of care, right? Which is the local place in the whole region where providers and stakeholders are coming together to plan and identify gaps and address homelessness. So we want to see that projects are coordinated within the region's continuum of care. And I think from what I understand from your homeless task force, you guys have some good connections back and forth between your local task force is thinking about Montpelier and that local continuum of care. But just want to say that's something that we would oftentimes be looking forward to just see that there's good coordination there and we may not have a specific funding source i think available for a specific project but part of what we could do is also help you identify what funding sources might be available even if it's not from dcf specifically um, another question share uh, sarah along those lines one of the structures we have in town that's underutilized and is owned by Washington County Mental Health. And I've talked to, to Mary Moulton there and she, she's interested in, in doing something with that properly different. It was set up as a dormitory. So it has a lot of aspects that might work for temporary housing. Uh, how do we, where do we get money to assess that building? It would come, I mean, is that another pot somewhere? It's a little different than direct service or direct purchase. Yeah, I think I'm not quite sure what you mean by assess the building, but I'm happy to follow up with you after Donna so I can understand a little bit better. It would be repurposing this building. It would be repurposing this building so it could be, become a housing structure, temporary housing structure. Yeah, so if you're looking sort of like feasibility from like an architecture or a building perspective or more from like a program design perspective, or partnership. I'm just maybe I can just follow all of it. Kind of, all, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so it'd be a little bit different. So the feasibility piece, I think, you know, I might point you all to working, um, you know, definitely if you have a specific project that would be a capital project around purchase or rehab, you could certainly reach out to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, also, Downstreet. Um, is a really great partner that you would have in your area. And I would point you to Downstreet to have that conversation as well. Um, and they might come out and look at a particular property and think about possibilities. There are best practices that we think about when we think about funding housing projects as well. And so if it's more like a program design best practice conversation, I do think the local homeless continuum of care is a good place to start and some of the partners um, at that table to help think creatively about what would make sense in this space based on the needs in our community. Um, 
So uh, happy to follow up with you separately if it's helpful. I will. We need your card too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think it's. I think it's just the video. Oh, the projector. Yeah. yeah, it's just the projector. Um, I have a, <clears throat> a question uh, to ask of you both. This may be outside of the scope of what um, you all do, but you know, as we think about the emergency camping policy that we are going to be talking about soon, one of the things that comes to mind is that the state has a significant amount of land in the city of Montpelier. Does the state have a camping policy? Like, could people who are experiencing homelessness um, camp on state land? Yeah, I would need to defer to our colleagues at the buildings and general services who um, are responsible for managing state state property and assets, uh, hard assets like that. And so, uh, I'm I would defer to Commissioner. Uh, Jennifer Fitch or Deputy Commissioner Marco Grady okay. um, on, on that matter. <clears throat> okay. Right. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Lauren. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner and Sarah, for being here. Um, I, it was really helpful to hear everything going on. I guess I'm still a little bit struggling with, like, is there a vision that the department has for ending homelessness and Specifically, I'm trying to think of how, you know, if we're working towards models locally, is it aligned with the vision that the department has? And as we try to, you know, allocate as many resources as we can, um, you know, how does that fit into the state's vision? And, and, you know, even thinking of like, are there examples of things that other communities are doing that you're seeing from your statewide perch that are good models that you would encourage us to look at and considering um, you know, we, I would just echo, would love to explore partnering on, you know, I think our capital city is a great place to do a pilot project. If there's some idea you've been, you know, looking to, to try like the tiny house village or a bunch of other ideas that um, Connor rattled off, but just, you know, any kind of context on what's, what's the vision and examples that you're seeing that we, that you think we should be looking at that, you know, you would be excited to help work with us on. Sure. And so, you know, we're a part of a larger, um, system or continuum in the state that focuses on homelessness. And Sarah, I would defer to you to kind of explain uh, some of those umbrella organizations and the membership and kind of their goal in that. But obviously the Agency of Human Services has had a goal to end family homelessness, um, particularly, um, you know, we know it's very detrimental to kids to be, you know, homeless living in cars or even motels are not ideal for kids. You know, it's isolating. It's hard for them to engage in, in school and they're isolated from their peers. And so, you know, um, we also recognize um, that we can't do it alone. And that's why we, you know, we partner and we're just one piece of that puzzle. But Sarah, I would kind of turn to you and to kind of to provide that sure. bigger context, broader context. Yeah, that's right. So I keep going back to the homeless continuum of care because that that is sort of, um, the federal government has blessed the Vermont Coalition and Homelessness, and then in Chittenden County, they have their own Chittenden Homeless Alliance, as really the organization that's meant to bring stakeholders together and have a plan on understanding what homelessness looks like in the state of Vermont and understanding the gaps and uh, resources and the strategies that we want to move forward and for really supporting that planning process. There's also a state um, council on homelessness that um, is due to refresh as the statewide plan to end homelessness. So we have no shortage of plans on how to end homelessness. And we actually know quite a bit about what we need to do, about the resources needed, um, both in terms of housing, uh, services, and rental systems. Um, and we're in sort of a really fascinating moment where we have a lot of resources on the table to have, help move those forward. I, am, I do think, um, you know, there are some cities and towns that are doing some really creative, um, having these same kind of conversations that you all have. I would point to Burlington definitely as one. Um, I know Brattleboro also is very engaged um, and has a committee. Um, and they're looking at some of the same things that you guys are as well, both around how, um, how they can better support and meet the needs of folks who are unsheltered um, and then also thinking about permanent housing. And I would definitely just 
um, you know, push that I think, and I put this in the chat box, but that, you know, local planning and zoning policies and regulations are really a really critical piece when we think about how to make sure we have an adequate supply of inclusive and affordable housing. And that is really the work of uh, municipalities. Um, and there's great new resources um, that uh, the Department of Housing Community Development and Vermont Housing Finance Agency and, and CBOEO have put together to support towns around that. So I put those links in the chat box and um, hopefully someone will yank those out and share them. Um, but just want to point to that as well. So I think, you know, to the extent that you guys um, are thinking creatively about permanent and how to expand permanent housing in Montpelier, I would say that feels really, really key at this moment. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, just a, a question about the studies, if I could. Uh, are those posted on your department's website, Sarah, as far as you said, you know so much about house homelessness and how I do can, I can put some, sorry, Don, I didn't mean to. Cut no, no, that's okay. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> no. Links in the chat box um, to places look to see some of those plans um, that exist. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to transition now to comments from the public. And so if we could get uh, the gallery view back up so that folks um, with hands raised could be uh, more visible, but we are gonna start uh, with people um, uh, who are here. So if you, uh, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, we can we go, go um, uh, Ken, then Larry, um, that would be great. Oh, and Don, sorry, yes. Um, yeah, so um, Ken will come up here and show you where you'll sit when it's uh, time to speak. Great, thank you. Hi, uh, Ken Russell here, I'm a Montpelier Homelessness Task Force. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Um, Sarah, can you uh, describe, our, is there any support for camping um, from your office? Oh, I think they're mu muted. We have to unmute this thing. Yeah. Bottom right. Maybe I use the mouse. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Uh, That's right. Is that right? Uh, Sarah, I'm sorry, Sarah. I thanks for being here. Um, is there any uh, monetary support for folks who are camping for any camping projects? Well, for us to have all of the public comment, and then let, um, after all of the, the public comment has happened, then um, Sean, if you could weigh in, that would be great. Um, but just to, to keep things yeah, sure. um, kind of moving, if that's, that's all right. Okay, oh, okay, great. <clears throat> that way we don't have to go back and forth between muting and unmuting, et cetera. So where am I speaking, Yep, you got it. Okay. Uh, my name is Laura Sutter, and my wife and I are um, also uh, we're advocates on um, Orca Media for um, people with special needs. We do a television program for people with disabilities called Equals and On Air. My question is um, for you, Commissioner. Um, you had mentioned now uh, my wife and I are formerly homeless, um, homeless a, long, um, uh, a long time ago, but uh, and we're now in the city of Montpelier, but my question is, you had mentioned only six apartments are going to be for the homeless. Why only six? Is there a specific reason for that? And he'll, he'll address that at, at the end. And then my second question, um, is there gonna be any more, is there gonna be any services specifically for people, because it's a double-edged sword, any services um, for people who are special needs or disabled, if you will, or uh, of any sort, plus homelessness, because it's a, it's a double-edged sword in that respect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm done. Hi, um, I'm Dawn Little. I am on the homelessness task force and I do street outreach in the area of Brookings, North Haven. 
I wanted to comment on Dan's question about how many people would be affected and where the gaps are. And I had a couple questions for the commissioner regarding some of the gaps in the adverse weather conditions system. Um, at the moment, I am aware of 40 individuals between Barry, Montpelier, and Berlin, most of them in Montpelier, the majority, and there's a lot of back and forth. In a traditional year, we would have an overflow capacity of 35 beds approximately <clears throat> between the Heading Church in Barry and Bethany Church in Montpelier. Uh, last year, we did not have those. I, my understanding was that the state did not fund it, did not fund a proposed shelter at Christ Church for longer than a few weeks because of the lack of a day space. Uh, so that was one, one issue I was interested in. The other thing is there will be a gap, even with the new shelters coming online, the purchase of the Twin Cities for 35 people. Um, coincidentally, that's the same, that's what our deficit is. Uh, between mid-November and the January projected opening date of the Twin City, we will be down 35 beds because of the lack of overflow. Um, in the past, we've had those 35, and then there are several people who, I don't know how many people use the, the adverse weather conditions system, but I'm wondering whether there's money available to improve that system a little bit in terms of access to it. Um, the three major barriers that I've seen in the past few years are transportation for people to get to the motel rooms that they receive vouchers for under adverse weather conditions. Access in that the, I, my understanding was that there was no money allotted to help train the people who answered the phones at night. And I've seen a lot of, a lot of confusion about the rules, a lot of miscommunication. Um, and in the time of COVID, it has been really difficult for people to get complete strangers to let them borrow their phone for two hours in a cold parking lot while they, you know, and you're not allowed to get callbacks. It, you're not allowed to have an advocate unless you're, you know, I'd say that's about 50% of the time. Um, so I'm wondering if there's more money for training, if there's money for actual transportation for people to get, to get people there. Um, my other concern is around the periods of ineligibility that people get, if people don't wanna disconnect from their services and go out of county, they're given a 30 day period of ineligibility, which seems a little bit harsh to me. Um, and the, the big issue of course is going to be the lack of capacity of the motels. And I have no idea, no idea what that's gonna be, but I would love to, to see if there's money that could be used to address some of those issues. Cause I know a number of people who end up staying outside either because they are unable to to get through to the operator, they're unable to communicate with them or they're unable to get to the site where they're given shelter. Um, so that's that's the main thing. Um, and the, you know, the overflow, I'm wondering if you would consider, if the state would consider, I'm sorry, funding some sort of overflow shelter that does not, is not contingent on the provision of a day space. Um, Cause that, I mean, in, in the ideal world, you would have a day space, but that's a pretty, you know, pretty harsh penalty. Instead of having people out on your streets during the day, you would then have them 24 hours a day. Um, last year, that situation was alleviated by the COVID, the motel rooms that were reserved for COVID people. But if that changes because of the tourism and the shift back toward that market, and we don't have that additional capacity, then we're going to be down more than 35 beds. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in person wants to come? Uh, cynically remarked that this is a hell of a way to write a plan. Um, what's become evident tonight, and it's been evident to me for a while, is that the disconnect between the on the ground impacts of how many people where needing what kind of services and the state folks who fund it and manage programs is so vast that uh, there's lots of good Samaritan might serve a third of the demand here. <laughs> And so I suspect we're going to have 100 people when the evictions start to rise, when the rest of the folks get kicked out of the hotels that got the extension based on disability or 60 years old. Uh, I've, my counts over the years, I, I think we're going to end up with about 100 people around central Vermont that we need to deal with. I don't know how many of those will be in Montpelier. Uh, I have tried to 
recommend that we address issues like, like use ARPA funds to get shower and toilet trailers and go to some official supervised camping locations, not to, not more than six or eight or 10 campers in one location to and allow the campsite coordinators to mix and match folks so you don't get all the drunks at one place. But this these hurdles of you know six units here or a two-year development cycle, it's absurd. We've got an emergency on our hands and we, we haven't talked about it yet tonight. You know, this this camping policy is not a solution. It's just a way to authorize invasion and disposal of people's property or storage of people's property. No one has written a plan of how to address getting people sheltered heading into winter and, and how many. So I'm more just sounding the alarm that this, this is a good conversation. It needs to have happened a year ago and it needs to happen again uh, at the end of the year. But we need to be making emergency preparedness right now. And the, ironically, the Parks Commission met last night and said, uh, we don't want any camping in our parks. And then, oh, but we need money. So maybe one of our money solutions would be to put camping platforms in the parks. So maybe, maybe some of your money could do that. Thank you. Anyone else in person wish to comment? And this could be questions uh, for the folks from AHS or on the uh, camping policy. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, David Pekersky. I am a uh, former um, homeless vet until I asked the VA for help. And now I have uh, permanent housing. Um, but I'm also an activist. Uh, for a lot of years uh, in the context of this conversation. Uh, one action we did was uh, uh, was a youth-led group, I believe it was in the fall of 2019. Um, we camped out on the State House lawn. Um, it was a great event. Um, it was well organized, a lot of uh, community, community effort and volunteer uh, work that was done. Uh, there was art, there was music, there was uh, lots of food, um, a lot of people pitching in to, to you know, do the work. Um, there was breakout groups and education and, all, and such. Um, so I'm thinking, like, why not combine these? Because um, I believe you all have a problem, like, where are we going to put this, this homeless uh, encampment? You know, can we put it in the parks? And, a lot of pushback from that. Um, so the idea is you know, from on the state house, you know, um, um, it's which opens up a lot of interesting conversations uh, that uh, many of us can have, uh, uh, creates more awareness. Um, and it, it, you know, sure. It's more or less a Montpelier problem, but it's a statewide problem. It's a national problem. It's also a state house problem. Um, so I think uh, that could not actually solve all the issues, but um, I think it would be an interesting step in the right direction. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ideas out there. Um, and when I hear that, um, it's like, well, you know, the, decision is do we choose this one, that one, or the other one? Um, and I think um, uh, implementing many of these ideas uh, would be very helpful. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you. All right, anyone else in person? Okay. All right, so we're gonna turn to um, folks who are with us virtually uh, and I see um just see the one hand for now um morgan uh and i think we might have to unmute um the this computer uh either mary mary's on or mary would you would you be on it thank you so much um and uh more, once you're once we're unmuted here morgan go ahead can you hear me all right 
Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Um, so first I want to mention that when Ken Russell was speaking, uh, we couldn't hear him on Zoom, and so we missed that. I have since been informed, you know, briefly about the question he asked, but, um, you know, we missed all that. Anyway, um, so is this the time where we're mainly posing questions to the commissioner or uh, or can we speak to the policy or both? I've, both are appropriate at this point. Okay, so um, the so this isn't a question so much as a comment on the Good Samaritan Haven Twin City Hub project. My understanding previously was it might open uh, beginning of December in some capacity because there are uh, certain funding requirements that uh, cause that. Uh, that said, the closing is coming up soon, as I understand it. Uh, hopefully it all goes well and uh, fingers crossed and that's great. Um, so the comments I have, I have two on the policy. And uh, I want to say that it appears to me as if most, if not all of the areas within my peer that might be suitable enough to camp. And this is regarding draft four of the proposed policy. The proposed to be off limits. If so, it begs the question about where people living unhoused outdoors that have no other place to go are supposed to be able to camp. In addition, in the proposal, proposed policy, it refers um, that they're supposed to refer people, you know, they come across these camps and they're supposed to refer people to available shelter or other resources. However, at the same time, there is not enough of either available as I understand. And if so, that is a completely meaningless and useless gesture. If there were enough shelter or other resources available, one would think that they would not be having this discussion in the first place. So my second comment goes to uh, page nine uh, concerning the 30 day storage of belongings. You know, uh, when they, a, a, an encampment is uh, cleaned up and moved. And the belongings are supposed to be stored for 30 days. That's not sufficient. Not at all. You know, has anybody given any, and I believe somebody had spoken to this before, has anybody given any consideration to the fact that unless somebody has their documentation and paperwork that they need to move on and and everything, unless they have that safely stored somewhere or on their person, if it's in the encampment and it gets all the belongings get picked up and stored for 30 days, and then it's dumped after that or donated somewhere, well, do you know how difficult it is to try to get documentation again if you're lucky enough to have it? It's hard, okay? So what I recommend, please, you know, up the storage time to 90 days at the very least, 120 would be better, but at least 90 days. And this has been done elsewhere. I've researched this. There are other municipalities that have it at 90 days and at least one in 120. And I also want to talk about storage at the rec center basement. You know, is that like the stuff is going to be on a box? And even if it's in plastic in a box, is it going to be free of, you know, getting mold? You know, person's clothes and paperwork and stuff are going to get all moldy if it hadn't been already? You know, I mean, 
has anybody thought of that? Please, you know, and I, I have major concerns about this policy, but those are some. All right. And if you got any questions, hey, please ask. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. All right. Um, <clears throat> again, also, if you are with us virtually and have a comment to make, you could use the raise hand uh, feature. That would be very helpful. Um, I don't see anyone else at the moment. You can also just unmute yourself and let us know that you'd like to speak. Okay, I am not seeing anyone. Um, so, uh, Don, did you have something else that you wanted to add? Yes. Um, just a very brief observation that if we do go with the currently proposed version, the designation of virtually every spot in Montpelier as a sensitive area cuts back on the 72 hour period for getting your stuff out and turns it into a 24 hour period. And frankly, that's the least of my worries right now. But that would be, I mean, 24 hours, you can easily be gone overnight and then to come back and have your stuff gone. So, so that is a concern that I have with, with the current edition of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before, yeah, go ahead. Uh, very, I'll be very brief. Uh, I believe that the council should table the discussion on the encampment policy. If for no other reason than the Housing Homelessness Task Force canceled their meeting this morning uh, through a lack of warning um properly having properly warned the meeting so this this policy is is not about responding to the needs of the unhoused population and so take it up some other day but let's get focused get your priorities focused on some creating some shelter uh in foul weather and in heat we haven't even had a cooling center uh in montpelier during these 90 degree spouts. So I think your priorities are way off and the amount of energy that was devoted to this sham of a policy could have actually made some progress on getting some actual uh, modest camping type shelter and hygiene facilities for Thank folks. You. All right, I wanna give an opportunity to Sarah or uh, Sean to, or <laughs> commissioners uh, to, um, to respond to some of the questions that were asked. Sure, and I'll have Sarah uh, jump in on one of Donna, uh, Don Little's questions regarding um, uh, the funding of the, the church project or facility last year. Sarah, if you wanna jump in here. Sure, yeah, and um, I'll just start by saying it's so great to see so many um, folks that I know are just such strong activists and workers in this um, speaking on this issue and Don and David and Ken and Morgan and others that I know have been doing this important work for a long time. Um, so Don, I would say that, um, so the Christchurch, um, it, so just let me back up just generally. Um, and I think you would agree with this, that day shelter is just as important for people experiencing homelessness um, to have some place to go during the day as they have in the evening. That said, we don't require that shelters are open 24-7 uh, um, in some places. Um, uh, zoning restrictions um, prevent that, which is unfortunate. Um, but we do require that all of our projects have, um, a, you know, have a plan in place for people to have some place to go during daytime hours. That was particularly challenging during COVID when a lot of our public spaces were closed during daytime hours. Um, but we also had a very wide um, eligibility, of, you know, wide access to the emergency housing program. I really appreciate your points around after hours and transportation being particularly at, um, barriers to for folks accessing that program. But we had that available for essentially almost everybody um, to be able to access that. So we worked with Good Samaritan Haven um, who had that site open. And uh, my understanding is that everyone that came in to get the, the, few, the folks that were um, uh, unsheltered at the time, they came into that shelter and they used it really as an opportunity for engagement to get connected with folks and to help them get into a motel room where they could have 24-7 um, shelter, which is just really important that we provide um, um, that we make shelter available for folks um, during all hours. So, so that was sort of 
approach to the Christchurch facility. I, I will say sort of generally, there are funds available for additional shelter capacity if there are organizations um, uh, that want to step up and are able to think about um, providing some additional shelter capacity, both you know temporary or just seasonally or just for this year. Um, that would be a referral to me specifically. Happy to have that conversation. I think um, our organizations that typically do this work are, are working really, really hard. I mean, have been working really, really hard. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a moment in time where the funding is not really the issue. It's just the capacity to do more sometimes. Um, but happy to connect with you if you have some thoughts about that. And I think I'll just jump in the end here. I think that I heard Ken ask a question about, maybe I didn't get this quite right, but about funding to support outreach to um, folks who are unsheltered. And I will say that's something also that our office does support and has funded um, and has some grants with organizations around the state who do that work, as well as the Department of Mental Health that are just really doing the outreach um, to folks who are unsheltered. So happy, Ken, if you want to follow up directly on that afterwards as well. I know you know how to reach me. Anything else you'd like to add? Sure. And, and uh, Don, you mentioned um, the, uh, accessing housing after hours. Um, the state has um, historically contracted with Vermont 211 to handle um, uh, the people seeking housing after hours when our, our offices are closed. Um, and we continue to, to, to contract with them for that service. Um, over the last um, year or two, they've, um, they themselves subcontract out during certain hours of the night. And that has been a really there's been instability in that subcontract where I think they're on their third subcontractor now. And so there was a lot of uh, turnover and new contractors and new staff coming on board. That has now stabilized um, uh, for, for the most part. And actually the legislature um, this past session allocated a, a additional funds for 211 to do this work so that they can hire more in-state staff to handle more of that in work in-state and not have to subcontract it out due to some of that instability of subcontracting it out. So hopefully, you, you know, folks will experience more stability in, in the referral and, and, and how to access that service after hours and will not, the calls will not take as long. Should be a relatively quick call after hours, particularly during adverse weather, because we ask just a very few questions to, 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 to move people to housing as quickly as we can. Okay. So I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a, at least one comment, thank you, Morgan. Uh, pertaining, oh, and, and, and um, I think Don as well uh, spoke to the encampment policy. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to, oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Please, yeah. yes. So I just had a couple things. First of all, thank you, Commissioner, for coming um, after our last meeting. We really appreciate you coming here. Um, I just want to offer a comment that, you know, for many years, most of our, particularly the small cities, haven't been engaged well you know it wasn't one of our core services it was sort of the state the nonprofit sector so this is something that's new to us so i guess i'd ask to make sure that the city governments are kept in the loop on some of these planning things i think traditionally you know through no fault you, you interacted with your partners in, and i know uh, initially when the hotel programs were coming in we were having trouble getting information about how many people were moving into montpelier and those kinds of things so if, if somehow we can be looped in that would be really great um and you know then i'd like to go a little bit to the funding and i think steve whitaker made a good point is that we, we do have an emergency situation and i, I realize sometimes going through the legislature can take time but are you know is there a way and you don't have to answer it right now necessarily but you know montpelier and in, in really the, the central cities the burlington's the brattleboro's berries that, that where, where homelessness tends to congregate you know, is there a way that communities like ours can access funds really quickly to do some of these types of things that that we you've heard us kicking around here um, that we've been frustrated because you know, like, as I said, we don't traditionally have a human services budget or those kinds of things. So how can how can we partner with you to do things quickly here in, in our cities, maybe using some state resources and know how? So as Sarah indicated, like if you had a like a, a, a shelter project you as a city wanted to get behind and you had a provider mm -hmm. to stand that up this winter, you know, Sarah, Sarah would be, Phillips would be the one you would go to with that, with that funding request. We do have through our housing opportunity program, 
funds that we set aside to support new, new projects each year to come online. Um, also, um, the BHCB, um, there's 10 million of the 110 that was initially allocated to them for, for a variety of different projects. My understanding and memory is 10 million was earmarked for expanded shelter capacity. And so I know, um, you, you know, I do not believe they've obligated all of the, those funds for that purpose yet, but I, I don't want to speak for the BHCB. Um, and so there may be an opportunity if you have a proposal that you could put together pretty quickly that you might be able to access funding there as well if it didn't meet the criteria for the housing opportunity program. Um, but with that, the, you know, there's the there's the physical space and, and making sure it meets all the needs and accessibility, but then there's also the services and that's the, the piece we'd want to part, you know, make sure we're in connection with and with your local continuum of care and service of providers because it, they really need to go together, you know, to be successful. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is that there's not necessarily rapid turnaround funds. Is well, that I accurate? would defer to, to Sarah on, okay. on how, you know, we usually, like we went out and requested proposals <clears throat> in the spring um, for our housing opportunity program. We reviewed those um, in June and those dollars went out in July. Okay. And so it, it and you know and we if there's a very project specific and there's an urgent need we can usually move that if there's fun, still funding be able to move it fairly quickly as long as you know we're there providing technical assistance and it's meeting all of the, the you know the the shelter requirements that OEO has to fund those that it okay. makes sure it's the needs. Uh, Sarah, you have something to add? Oh yeah, I mean I, I think Sean's right. Like um, you know funding comes with expectations and requirements and sometimes so you know you don't have to have a fully baked proposal to come to us you can come to us and say this is what we're thinking about and we can help point you in the right direction again even if it's not us that would be the funding source specifically i would just want to point back again to say that working with and through the washington county homeless continuum of care is going to be one of the best ways to stay connected and coordinated um, particularly regarding new projects or new initiatives or funding opportunities. Um, we, use, um, we use the continuum of care infrastructure and network, um, which is really meant to be the place where our stakeholders are all stakeholders, not just service providers who are wanting to address these issues are coming together. It's really the local place um, where, where that, that hub for that information. So I, I just would point back to that again as being a really key way to stay connected. But, it's a point well taken that we um, want to continue to be in good communication with our municipalities. Thank you. And yes, thank you again also for, for being here and, and taking the time to answer our questions. We really appreciate it. Um, anything else? Okay. I just see we wrap up with them. Yep. The that's fair. <laughs> that is, that's fair. Thank you. All right. So moving on to um, the. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. But if you want to vote on something. <laughs> <laughs> and Morgan is waving his hand, if you would allow it. Uh, Morgan, go ahead. Yeah, um, a couple of things. One, thank you, Bill, for that question. It was a good one, and uh, it needs to be asked, and, uh, um, and I appreciate the response to that, and I hope that it's seriously, uh, uh, it's taken seriously and, and something done about it. We, we, need, we need action and we need it now. I wanted to say that I agree with Dawn uh, with her concerns. And I also agree with Steven with his point that, you know, uh, you know, discuss the policy fine, but otherwise, you know, I agree that it needs to be tabled and uh, for the reasons Stephen cited, and and uh, you know this discussion that we've had up to now, this has been good. This has been what's needed. You know, it's too bad we haven't focused more on this before, but at least we are now. This is what we need to be talking about, and more importantly, doing. The policy, yeah. Uh, I have major problems with it myself, and if you table it, uh, I won't lose any sleep tonight over that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you again. Um, all right, so switching our attention to the encampment policy. Um, council, uh, do you have thoughts or comments on the current version? I mean, I, I could start us out um, here, I suppose, unless other, someone else wants to jump in. Go ahead, Dan. No, I, well, I'm, I'm happy to. I, I guess, you know, the question that I, I have is one that's been asked already tonight, which is, you know, there's a number of high sensitivity, high sensitivity areas identified, uh, but I was kind of struggling to think about what city property doesn't fit within this high sensitive, high sensitivity area designation. Um, and I think that's important because the case law indicates it's not just simply saying, well, you can't camp here, but it's also identifying where you, where, where camping is tolerated um, outside of such high sensitivity areas. And I'm, I, I, that strikes me and I have some additional thoughts, but that, that at least seemed like a threshold issue and question to understand. Yeah. Oh, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. And, and had the same thought. And just as a follow-up question, and I know that the, the um, iterations of the draft of the policy have been moving somewhat quickly, but I wonder if there it has been an opportunity to update the map. You know, there was the original map that sort of showed the full inventory of what was proposed, but now with these with these new considerations of how we define high sensitivity, has that map been updated so we can see what's what is available and what's not available. I think that would be an important piece of moving forward with this. Connor, go ahead. I, I think we got to shift the debate on this. Um, it's, it's kind of a bit ridiculous with the geography and uh, like all respect to the Parks Commission, it's, you know, I, I know they took three meetings to look over this and we really did want their input, and respect them as an elected body. But it's a farce. If you like take parks out of the equation here, there's nothing. It's it's, it's no policy at all. Um, I, I think we really want input about like, okay, there's wetlands in some areas of the parks, you know, there's high traffic areas. Maybe the old shelter is not a good part to go here. But like, you know, just reading the news, it's like, okay, the first patch that was offered was like underneath the underpass, a bit of grass. Um, and the Peace Park, and that wasn't acceptable. But now you take this off. I, I think we're we're getting out of reality here. And the letter that was sent today, I mean, it acknowledges people are camping there now. They have camped there in the past. They'll camp there in the future. So the question is, what directive do we want to give our staff as far as how to handle this, right? I think, like, as long as it doesn't impair government operations, um, as long as it doesn't present a clear health and safety risk, um, what should we be doing? It Okay, so, like, the state, you know, the vouchers dried up. We say go to a homeless shelter. The homeless shelter says we're full. Uh, get it, get a tent. You know, they get a tent. They go to the park. And what are we going to do? Are we going to like tell people to go in some place that doesn't exist for services? Are we going to arrest them? It's like, so I, I think we have like really, you know, I agree with Steve. We spent too much time on this policy. With the time we spent talking about this, we could come up with solutions. So I, I'd recommend either tabling it, you know, strike the city park, park piece, or just have one line that says if it's government operations. For a health and safety risk, uh, that's out of order here. But you know, I, I, I don't love the direction the conversation's been going here. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, in defense of Parks uh, Commission, you know, I think they struggled with the idea of what what was a acceptable area, and I don't think they're making the argument that you know all of Hubbard Park is unsafe for for camping i mean clearly people have camped in there for years i think what they're saying is is that if you ask us what's a high sensitivity area we can't define one area or the other which i think is fine it's it's in some ways they've done you know they've come to a logical conclusion with an impossible task um because you can't cordon off parts of parks and say that they are or they aren't what strikes me is, though, if you take the high sensitivity area out of the equation and just simply look at what's left of this policy, uh, there's actually some some meaningful provisions in there, particularly going to your point, Connor, um, you know, on the uh, bottom of page four, going into page five, it talks about, you know, areas outside of high sensitivity areas where the city staff would consider the following findings to decide if any level of in intervention is appropriate. And that 
then enumerates various public health findings or public safety findings. I mean, that's that gets to the heart of what we're really looking at here is we want a policy that if somebody's camping, like if somebody decided to camp in the rotary in, in, in and, and Main Street, it, it would be dangerous because trucks go up on that all the time. There's a public safety and health risk um, to somebody camping there. That that's pretty easy to identify. Um, but there may be other situations. You know, if somebody's camping by the North Branch uh, River and it's a heavy rain event, there's a flooding danger there that, that could cause them harm. You know, I mean, those type of things are the things that I think we're we're conscious of as a city in, in this in this policy. Um, I, I don't think there's any doubt that there are parts of the park where if somebody was camping on a side of a hill that's an erosion danger, that that's that's a danger. And, but I think if we have something that's much more gives the city staff much more flexibility as far as findings go, then then it might be something where I think what we're trying to do is create something that's clear that if people encounter people camping, that they can take clear action if there is a public health or public safety threat. And we, we can identify it so that city staff doesn't have to go, hmm, what's this? They can say, ah, here's the, here's the process. We, you know, we don't have to make these critical decisions because here it is in a policy in a paper. But I think the high sensitivity areas just go beyond that because it's true. You know, these are areas that we don't promote camping in. Um, because they're not really, they're, they haven't been laid out and they haven't been established as good camping areas. But as we said at the beginning of this, this is not about camping. This is not, you know, we're not inviting the scouts to come up to Hubbard Park. These are people that are desperate, that are in, in particular circumstances, and we're trying to provide pathways for them into the shelter and, you know, um, process of, of trying to find a home um, but also keep them safe if they're going to be out in these city environments as well. I mean, uh, so in that respect, you know, maybe ejecting the high sensitivity and focusing on various public health and public safety issues um, maybe is the way to go. I would be okay with that. <laughs> I, knowing that we may want to tweak it, right? Yep. That it still may be something that we want to adjust. Um, I like the idea of having it be <clears throat> instead of geographically based, criteria based, um, where public health and safety are focuses, but then um, what that doesn't include in my mind is um, camping on school grounds, um, on grave sites, you know, other places that there's no controversy about, you know, not camping on those places, but um, I'm not sure that they fit exactly into a I mean, ar arguably a safety issue um, on school grounds, but um, you know, there, there there may be some additional things to consider if we were to just take out that um, highly sensitive <clears throat> uh, areas, high sensitivity area portion of it, and just relied on the the health and safety bit. Um, other, other thoughts? Uh, yes, Lauren. Um. I definitely like the direction that this is going much better. Um, I think criteria can be much more workable. You know, again, this is how are we directing our city staff to respond, um, you know, to, to these situations. Um, and I think we do need to acknowledge that it's happening, it's been happening. And, and so what are we trying to prevent here? How do we, res you know, want to be responding humanely treating people with dignity, also protecting the safety of our community and, and you know, all of those criteria. So I think taking out the high sensitivity areas, really focusing on criteria, I think you could get at things like schools and things in a set of criteria probably. Um, so I, I think that approach is, seems much better to me than where this landed. Um, I, I also just in parallel, you know, part of the conversation has been you know, there's not services in a lot of these places. And so I just, you know, want us to keep, as we're talking about this, you know, where are the bathroom facilities that, you know, what, what's the short term that we can get out there now? We've got, um, you know, this, this emergency American Rescue Plan money, like, like what can we be doing now? I think a lot of what I've heard from community members is, you know, we should be doing more, <laughs> nobody should be camping. And, and so it's like, 
well, it's happening, so we need to be able to respond for our uh, our city staff to be able to respond, and we should be doing you know everything we can to, um, especially you know we don't always have these kind of resources available. So what are we doing to get on the ground more services for people and you know working towards the kinds of solutions? It was really great to have the commissioner and be thinking longer term and some of these medium and and longer term solutions um, that are obviously top of mind for us. It's not that this this is our solution to <laughs> to addressing um, this issue at all and never has been. So I think that is an important broader frame, but that would be my current thinking. Uh, Jay and then Jack. Hi, Jack. And get, yeah, thanks. I, I agree. I think that uh, I know that there was criticism for the previous uh, version of the policy, but in a lot of ways, I, I think it was actually better because it seemed to be a humane balance between what we're telling our city employees, which is not bothering people uh, when they uh, need to sleep outside to provide to ask our city employees and to coordinate with the social service organizations to provide information and access to needed services while still setting forth criteria for city intervention and uh, what all the details should be probably still needs to be worked out um, I agree with other people who say that it's hard to tell where what's left once we take out what's now defined as a highly sensitive area. Um, and I know I've heard people say, well, <clears throat> we shouldn't bother people at all. We shouldn't even approach them with uh, social services. And uh, and I understand that there's a privacy concern there, but I do think that the interest in public health and safety and to let people know how they're gonna get services or how they can get services if they choose to do that outweighs the extreme uh, desire for uh, privacy that some people have. Um, <clears throat> one, one detail thought that I had that I didn't see in the policy and I made a suggestion the last time around is, and maybe maybe the city's already doing this, but uh, to make sure that any, all the employees of any of the city departments that uh, are likely to be inter interacting with people who are uh, sleeping outside should, uh, should be have, have training and uh, the resources for the use of uh, naloxone available to them so that if they come upon an emergency, they would be able to uh, to address it. But I agree with Lauren that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, Jay. Yeah, I just I wanted to add, um, I do appreciate the, the direction this conversation is going and where we're headed to, to a more practical um, um, policy here, but I do I do think it's important to um, to uh, speak to the Parks Commission's concerns a little bit more, having been part of a, not all but um, some of the conversations around this this ordinance, um, and I think it's important for us to all appreciate that they um, saw this ordinance sort of through a different lens or different filter than we did. Uh, in their, from their perspective, it was not only about public health and safety, but you know, as the Parks Commissioner, the Parks Commission, they are stewards of our natural resources, and I think that they found themselves, like it was mentioned, kind of in an unwinnable situation where they were on a very slippery slope, where if they tried to define very specific parts of parks that were acceptable versus what wasn't, then you know, they're really. It just it, they didn't have the time to put together you know that level of nuance and ultimately it was it was best for them to say hey you know we, we need to not cut off our nose to spite our face from a natural resource perspective here um and so let's add you know we think that that just adding parks as as these highly sensitive areas makes sense i do think it's very relevant um that 
uh, wetlands, waters, and waterways were called out as a separate entity because I think that that's that's important. Having having people um, uh, camping and and spending significant amounts of times in these areas impacts water quality, and we know we have E. coli issues in in our in our rivers in the city. And so I think that sort of working towards a more um, refined set of directives like we've talked about will you know make you know really make this 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 ordinance that much more effective and it just might need that time to be able to you know specifically call out and identify sort of really refine what the new version of that map might look like uh, and I have my hand up can oh sorry go ahead Donna that's okay. Uh, I just didn't think you probably you were even looking for I, it. Um, I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. I just, I feel bad having to interrupt you. Um, I really echo what's been said, particularly the emphasis on the health and safety findings, but also what Jay said. I, you know, I think we should respect where the commission, Park Commission is coming from. And as I said last meeting, we really need to just act on the housing, whether it's a, a emergency kind of shelter, tall it, multi trailers that we put out to make available. I mean, that hygiene is so important wherever people are sleeping and temporarily. Um, it's, it's essential to help them keep themselves together as well as the safety steps for the areas around them. So I think we really need to put some money there and work with the state. I mean, reaching out, Sean and Sarah gave us wonderful ideas here. And, you know, I, I guess I'd like to see um, a small committee um, really acting out or assisting staff to reach out to the state and, and see what we can do. I mean, really quickly, really soon. Uh, it's just so important. It's been way overdue. So that's where I'm coming from. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I see two potential paths forward. One is uh, we remove the, trying to find like where it starts exactly, but the highly sensitive areas, I guess it starts on page one, mm -hmm. um, and remove that section um, and approve the remainder of it tonight with the understanding that we might wanna come back and add another bullet under the findings prompting city interventions. And I could picture, um, uh, an additional bullet being something like uh, environmental findings, uh, which would include the wetlands, uh, you know, steep slopes or whatever. Um, and I think we could include in that uh, things like grave sites, um, so that you know that there there's some environmental uh, considerations. Um, <clears throat> And so we come back and approve that later. Alternatively, we table the whole thing and uh, add a, a, a bullet, say, like that um, for the next meeting. Um, Dan, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to respond to it because. No, the, those are just the two paths forward I see right now. I, I, I would tend to favor the second only because I, I think it might help if the city council you know, either working with the assistant city manager, um, or though she's on vacation, okay, she, um, to to make some of these changes because I think it's more than just taking one section out. So, like for example, at the bottom of page four, there's another reference to highly sensitive area. I think it's just it's a okay. little bit oh, more yes, entangled, sure. yeah. and I I wouldn't yeah. want to approve something that yeah. just didn't. Uh, function well and and I you know the cemetery issue actually I think might even require a second bullet point which is there, there's private rights involved in cemeteries so you know if you start camping out on somebody's gravesite technically uh, that's private pro, pro, there, there's a private interest in there that's not in other public lands that may give rise to to, to some of those issues now uh, frankly most of the people residing in said spots are not complaining um, at least as far as we know um, but, uh, you know, family that would exactly. <laughs> their families are, their the families family, are. The, fam the families are, you know, um, uh, but I mean, that's, you know, and that's, and that's particularly, I mean, they do have a different vested interest in that. That's, that's different than the environmental, the public safety or the, 
public health. There's there's a pri- uh, intersection of private rights. So I mean, I, I, at least I, although I seem to be working three jobs <laughs> l- lately, but I, I know I would love to take a little bit of a crack at it since we are building towards this consensus and maybe have some language that we can at least come closer to going to your first line of action, which would be, you know, we think we've we've taken out some of this language and taken some of the wetlands and environmental issues and stuck them in where we want to and not just simply uh, approve them Harry carry. Sure. Okay. I second that. Is that a motion? I, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, <laughs> you may well, have to word it for John, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that we, we table uh, the this homelessness camping policy uh, until the next meeting uh, with the idea that the city councilors will take an opportunity to enact the criteria based um, standards versus the sort of blanket high sensitivity area geographic criteria. Okay. And Donna, the, that was the second from you? Yes. Okay. And I uh, see that we have another hand. If you want to come address the council, that'd be just fine. Um, I'm Dan Dickerson. I'm a member of the Parks Commission, and I'll keep my comment short, but I would just ask that you include someone from the Parks Commission on whatever edits that you make to the policy, because this will impact parks, and, and we do have uh, a different mission than you guys do, and, and that's not to disrespect the mission that you have, and, and you know, I know that you feel differently than we do, than we do at this point, but please include us. Um, you know, the, the whole policy sort of took us by surprise and, and we've spent a lot of time trying to respond to it and um, we want to get it done right. So please yeah. include us. Yeah. That's a, a good call. And I want to apologize that uh, that it was a surprise to you all. And um, so thank you. And, and we'll include you on, uh, on these edits. Um, so there's a motion a second to table uh, the policy for now. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say Matt, aye. Matt aye. Mia, Matt. Morgan, we're, I, is it, <laughs> we're well, about to vote, is it? <laughs> well, first, can I ask a question? Uh, what's what's the motion? Because I wasn't uh, it's sure. To table this, it's to table this yeah, point policy. Of order, point yes. of order, Matt Mayor. Yes. I, I don't think the public has an opportunity to weigh in on a motion once the discussion. Well, I just wanted to ask what the motion was. <laughs> So, so to clarify, it's to table the uh, encampment policy. Uh, sorry, um, all in Thank favor, you. please say aye. 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 Okay, so we have tabled it for now. Um, it is 827. Um, Lauren, something. Just, just a quick offer of volunteering myself and Connor to have some as the remaining lobbying committee to have a conversation about outreach to state and maybe some of our excellent local uh, legislators who about funding opportunities for some of the things and, and identify some next Great. steps for you all. And if I could just give a quick update, sure. I was playing phone tag with the commissioner of BGS today. Um, Ken from the Homelessness Task Force has uh, made a great connection with a church down in North Carolina that's willing to bring a trailer up with shower facilities, uh, laundry facilities. And uh, the problem is finding a place outside the floodplain, but the state's uh, has to be a partner with us on that. Um, so so that would be good. And uh, Representative Mary Hooper would be happy to be in any meeting she's in on, on that type of thing with the state. So. Great, great. Okay, um, since it is 828 now, we are going to take a 10 minute break as is our normal uh, 830 tradition. We'll be back in 10 minutes. So I'm gonna say 838, just so that we can keep moving. All right, so we are coming back from our break. <clears throat> Even though Jack is not back present with us, we still have a quorum, so we're gonna move on. We've got Donna here virtually. Uh, just as a heads up to folks that we are going to skip the <clears throat> item eight traffic calming presentation. Um, we will do that at another time. Uh, but for now, um, we have uh, Keisha Rum, I'm forgetting, you have a new stale. Well, Hinsdale, <laughs> yes, right. Uh, Keisha Rom uh, Hinsdale with us um, from Creative Discourse to discuss our uh, social and economic justice equity report. So I'll turn it over to you. And I'm actually going to find a different seat as the, 
transition, of course, somehow that whenever great. That I think Mary's gonna working on that. Okay, okay great. Nice. Shana, the, yes. the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, Shana Casper, I believe, was going to say some introductory words. Yeah, I'll just say a few words just to start us off. Um, so just to, to kind of reground us and why we're here before yeah, handing it over to Keisha. Um, yeah, my name is Shana Casper, I live in Kent Street. I'm the chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, CJAC. Um, and we were formed a few years ago because the Montpelier City Council wanted assistance to address and reshape the systems and policies and practices that perpetuate the historic and ongoing systems and structures in our, in our nation and our state and our community that perpetuate racism and sexism and heterosexism and classism and ableism and so many other forms of injustice and oppression. And as we've seen over the past few months uh, during COVID and over the past few weeks and exemplified by the conversation earlier tonight, um, and, and, you know, in a conversation on front porch forum in places is that this work is really critical and really important to have right now, you know, that this oppression is not just structural, but it's also playing out, you know, interpersonally um, and directly impacting folks um, in our community. And last year, City of Montpelier signed a contract with Creative Discourse. Um, uh, this was just a consulting group based in Burlington for drafting an equity plan informed by community dialogue, understanding of best practices and engagement. And over the past year, we've merged this work with the school board, with the police review board of review committee for, for their work. And, you know, as, as Kish will say, we've got hundreds of responses. We surpassed our goals, but really hearing from our community that this work was so critical to, to, to have. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're doing this work in a very specific context right now. You know, the pandemic, the uprising for racial justice and so much have just laid bare the need of doing more of this work and that the need for this work is ongoing and imperative. So just um, kind of wanting to start off uh, by, by just kind of grounding there and then, um, you know, after the presentation will also be available for questions. So take it away, Keisha. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much, Shana. Uh, you know, not, not my so I didn't want to assume, um, but for those of you who may not hmm. can't hear who's talking. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yes. Switch the microphone to Try the other microphone. Try the other microphone. Do we have to meet? <clears throat> You want to turn down the speakers on your laptop? Sure. We got the speakers on the Somebody else have? Yeah. Yeah. Can can people hear me on Zoom? Give me thumbs up. Oh, okay, yeah. thumbs up. Okay. okay. Well, that's good. Great. <laughs> Sorry, right, thank you. <laughs> Not missing my time in city government, but really appreciating the patience and kindness of this mayor, city council, city manager. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, Keisha Ron Hinsdale, I hail from Shelburne since it asked us to name where we live. Um, my work partners are here, Tabitha Moore and Sue McCormick, virtually, um, who also live in Chittenden County. Uh, and we, as Creative Discourse, have worked with uh, community school districts, nonprofits, and other organizations around the state. Uh, we have ongoing work with the city, with the town of Essex, the Essex Westford School District. We've worked with the city of Winooski, Colchester School District, 
Vermont Land Trust, Pride Center, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. So we have a, a varied group of folks that we work with, and it can be anything from helping to plan an inclusive graduation to an equity assessment for the Community Health Center of Burlington. So, um, you know, we often will do what we can with public information about our work to sh share and help you understand where you might fit in with the larger conversation that's happening around the state. But we, of course, appreciate, um, you know, Montpelier's leadership, forethought, and having the CJAC, um, you know, the, the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Council engage with us starting in, I want to say, 2019. Um, so, you know, it's been a long journey that started before the pandemic. And we're grateful to be with you. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Mary. Um, so our project goals that were captured in, uh, you know, a contract and an RFP that we, um, that you have ratified is to capture the concerns and needs of underserved and underrepresented communities in Montpelier and to identify effective strategies to engage with and include underserved and underrepresented communities in Montpelier. Um, that is two of five goals that we outlined as part of much more long-term project that you know we may or may not be the ones to be completing that with you. We have um, you know a kind of philosophy around trying to have long-term relationships. Um, you know, but those are our two goals that we tried to capture with this project. Our, the picture that we have next is, you know, I think um, has disappeared, which is fine. Um, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's must be sensitive, the kind of slide um, flow. So hopefully this is just a calming picture as you are in a long meeting. <laughs> um, you know, but for us, it's also a moment to pause and really caution you all that what we're trying to do is really zoom in and, you know, see the trees, see the forest for the trees, see the beauty and richness of your community um, and not jump to diagnose or to explain away or to hypothesize because we did some thick and thin engagement as we might say, really thick engagement with going deep hour and a half conversations with specific community members and community leaders, um, some thin engagement, which is in the form of a survey where we're trying to capture a broad swath of understanding what's going on in the community. Um, so we're asking you to toggle back and forth between those perspectives, but not try and, you know, jump right to action or explanation because we're just sort of uncovering community sentiment. And we can go to the next slide. Um, so what we did to conduct this uh, equity audit is a series of focus groups. Um, we worked with CJAC and some folks on the council and elsewhere to make sure we had a broad swath of what kind of community stakeholders we should engage. Um, we had a goal of 300 plus responses to a community survey, and um, we met that. And we'll talk later about other goals we had within the survey that were also met. Um, we did some one-on-one -on -one interviews as well because you have some really key stakeholders and, and thought leaders in the community. You know, the very few, for example, BIPOC staff that you have were important to have those deeper dives into their experience. Um, <laughs> we stayed in touch with CJAC throughout the process. And um, I want to name, you know, as well that we really tried to honor the work of the um, police review committee um, and not eclipse or distract from their work around policing with what we were doing, only try to supplement our support with affinity spaces for BIPOC community members or other ways that we could help them um, and inform their work. And of course, you know, we wanted in our survey so that we didn't have to send out a number of surveys to your community that stays super engaged, but probably gets fatigued and confused by all, all of this process. We wanted to um, add a, a question about public safety, the vision for public safety in the community. So you'll see that come up. And of course that gets right to policing for a lot of folks, but you know, we just wanted to um, have a light touch on policing as part of our broader equity audit. And we can go to the next slide. Um, these were, I think it's a, might be a little bit cut off, but it, you, you're getting a sense we, um, we spoke with about 80 plus folks in the focus groups um, that included 
you know, residents in, in affinity spaces, particularly so that they could speak a little bit more freely about their unique experiences. Um, people who might identify as community leaders because they're leading a formal or informal organization or effort <clears throat> in the community. Um, and we had a focus group with city staff who are in a number of different divisions and departments, as well as a special session to talk to um, the emergency service folks in the city as well. Um, we, even then we had, you know, we wanted to break it out further and talk to police officers separately because they were getting on late. They had had a long night. We could really get a sense that there was, you know, it, they made the commitment to be present for us. So we wanted to be present for them. Um, and so we had almost 350 people respond to the survey. 88% uh, lived in Montpelier. We are able to somewhat break out the 12% outside of Montpelier. They really considered themselves part of the community. And we didn't see any trends when we broke that data out that felt worth saying, you know, this is a big concern to people who live in Montpelier versus, versus Doe. We, we let people, we left that 12% in it didn't really change as much. And it probably helped us a little bit with some of the demographics as well of people who consider Montpelier part of their community. Um, so we, we had a goal um, to have at least 10% of the respondents um, be from the BIPOC community. And um, we were able to exceed that goal as well. And you can see a little bit more of the breakdown there. About 19% BIPOC respondents or 18% because of sliver, nope, that's more. So 11%, that sounds more right. So 11% um, BIPOC respondents, 8% declined to state their race or ethnicity. Um, we had a wide range of um, sexual orientations identified by respondents as well. Um, a chunk who preferred not to say as well, but we felt um, good about getting uh, diversity around sexual orientation. Um, this is something that seems to be part of the Montpelier story, you know, particularly, I, this may be common to capital cities around the country. I'm kind of fascinated to know more, but as I understand it, and, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, um, Montpelier has about double the number of master's and doctoral terminal degree holders of the general population of Vermont. And then this survey response had about double that population. And that's how we arrived at having over half of the respondents having a master's or doctoral degree. So, you know, for us, that was worth highlighting. And when you combine that and a college degree, that's, you know, a pretty stark um, divide in terms of who might have had the time capacity and information in their network to respond to the survey. So, you know, with more time, we might dig into that in a deeper dive um, to better understand, you know, how that plays into what we saw in the rest of the data. Um, so these are some of the themes uh, around experiences living and working in Montpelier. Um, and we started with some of our survey data. Um, we, you will see about a 20 point spread um, when we look at different demographics that don't represent, let's say the majority or the dominant group in the community. Um, of where there's a gap in that sense of belonging. So um, you have less than half of the BIPOC respondents saying they feel a deep sense of belonging and about two thirds of the white respondents say they feel a deep sense of belonging. Um, we can talk to you further um, at a later time. We try to ask a question similar to this in a lot of the communities we work in and this is not out of whack with you know, communities that are trying to dig into differences and in feeling a sense of belonging. Um, again, you see about a 25%, my math might be off right now because it's getting late, but um, a 24% spread um, difference in the gap between the sense of belonging for people who identified in the LGBTQ plus community and those who identified as uh, heterosexual. Um, you see that similar 19% difference um, and no one, please, get me on my mouth right now um, as it approaches 9 p.m., but uh, between those who do not have a college degree 
and those who had a college degree. Of course, we had a, a relatively small sample of people who don't have a college degree, but there was still a similar difference. Um, we had, um, you know, more BIPOC respondents say they've experienced or observed racism in Montpelier. Um, and we have, you know, uh, over half of white respondents say they feel they have experienced or observed racism occurring in Montpelier. <clears throat> um, you know, I, I hope this seems valuable to you, you know, no matter what the overall um, topic of the survey, you know, this is valuable information, I think, for any community. Um, we, you know, wanted to better understand how people were experiencing public meetings and their ability to engage with the city. And um, the, we, we pulled out the highest percentage of responses where people would be more likely to participate if two thirds said they felt confident their participation would make an impact. Um, well over half said if they could attend virtually, uh, still over half said if the meetings included hearing from people with a diverse range of lived experiences, um, and 40% said they felt confident the space um, would be made safer for people from marginalized groups. So those were definitely far and away our highest responses. Everything else lingered below a third um, by far. And um, this section, again, want to go back to that drop of water containing the forest. You know, this is us trying to understand a little bit more about um, if there was a difference with different segments of the community experiencing city departments and services um, at it, with different levels of satisfaction um, or feeling a sense of inclusion. And um, you will see some differences. And I just invite you to sort of, you know, look at the numbers, take it for, for what it is um, without, you know, too much prejudgment about what exactly it might mean. Um, so um, here we just have an overall picture of, you know, all the respondents who felt engaged and valued. Um, and you have, it's a little hard to see probably here, but that there's dark green and light green that represent always feeling engaged and valued to often feeling engaged and valued. Yellow gets you to sometimes, orange to never, and gray to not applicable. Fire and rescue, probably don't want to feel engaged and valued, you know, necessarily probably don't want to have to interact with fire and rescue. So a little bit more not applicable senior center, again, specific population it serves. But otherwise, um, you know, you see some differences just overall in terms of how people feel engaged and valued across the um, city divisions that we um, looked at. And then we'll just as an example, we don't have the breakout here by all identity categories, but we wanted to use um, differences between BIPOC respondents and white respondents as an example of real differences when you look deeper into this information. City Council, um, I don't know if anyone has looked at this before, you know, tonight or this moment, it's obviously probably hard to see that, that there's a really big difference um, in always feeling engaged and valued from the BIPOC community, about 3%, and the white community about 23%. So that's a pretty big delta. Um, we won't get into you know, why or what that means, um, but you, know, you see uh, it kind of stays a little bit different, but that always um, indicator is, is, is pr pretty big delta for the city council. Um, police department, um, you had um, about, uh, you know, four times the delta of BIPOC respondents saying they feel engaged in value to white respondents. Um, and then you have, um, you know, a, a bigger number for never, the ones in the middle, even out a tiny bit, but, you know, you have about double the number of BIPOC respondents say they never feel engaged and valued by the police department. Um, city clerk's office, you still have a difference of about oh, a multiplier of two between um, BIPOC respondents who always feel engaged and valued versus white respondents. Um, you do see e an even bigger delta than on the end with um, BIPOC respondents who never feel valued by the city clerk versus a very small percentage who 
who would say that in the white community. Um, so it's interest, very interesting differences in each, each um, department and division, sort of not, not a clear trend. Um, fire and rescue, you have more BIPOC folks who say it's not applicable to them. Over half have not interacted with fire and rescue. Um, and you have, you know, some, some differences as well in each of the different always, often, sometimes, and never. Um, so that kind of runs us through the, a lot of the, um, raw survey data that we, we tried to, I mean, it's not raw. We analyzed it a little bit and tried to pull it apart. Um, we really want to emphasize that what follows here is our attempt to, um, to create themes. Was there one before, did we do city services before, please? I don't know what that Okay. Bear with us on Zoom, folks. We're just trying to. Well, we could do police, sorry. Okay, we, there we go. So um, these are community ideas for change. So these came from the focus groups and they came from the qualitative comments in the survey responses. We had a lot of qualitative comments in the survey responses, well over a hundred in a lot of the different um, categories of the 300 plus people who responded. Um, I tried to, you know, I'll, I'll take blame or credit for this among my team. I tried to just break them down into operational, relational, and structural. To me, an operational is the idea that it's, you know, something, a technical change you could make. Nothing is technical and easy to solve in city government particularly, but it's more of a technical uh, change that people are talking about. Relational is more of a human capacity training, you know, relational change that people want. And structural is kind of a combination of the two. Um, the, a little bit more of the long-term things like ending homelessness, addressing housing, which you just talked about in your last segment. Um, so these are, this is what emerged as really strong themes from um, the qualitative feedback that there be more accommodations at meetings for people with disabilities, that the website be improved in terms of content, language access, um, you know, and, and I, I want to emphasize this is community feedback. We have our own kind of meta recommendations as, as consultants toward the end. Um, it came up quite a bit to have anti-racism training for the staff. Um, pause. Um, I appreciate you trying to go all the way down because there's like yeah. quotes and stuff, but it seems like it's very sensitive to wanting to go to the next slide. I apologize for that. Um, and as you saw from some of the quantitative feedback as well, people really want the remote meeting options um, to remain as a way to participate. In, a, in the relational category, um, you know, we heard more general feedback about improved communication and outreach that, um, and also targeted communication outreach to specifically underserved populations. Um, this could be language access or it could be just making sure that people who um, you know, information is in clear, plain language, et cetera. Um, people wanted receipt of communication to their city councilors. You know, I know what it's like to be a public servant and not be able to get back to everybody. Um, that did come up several times. And having a kind of feedback loop. So there was an ongoing way to learn what people's needs are and how to integrate them into city government. Structurally, things you probably all talk about a lot in your work, um, but addressing housing issues and um, experiences of discrimination towards people experiencing homelessness or the unhoused, um, reviewing and revising policies through an equity lens, which is the journey you are on, and um, making an effort to hire more uh, women and BIPOC staff, especially in places where they are underrepresented. Um, we tried to pull out a quote in each section. Um, this one seemed, um, you know, representative overt efforts to show an attention to marginalized groups like publicizing meeting info through non-traditional routes. It's okay, making sure there is captioning on all videos on websites, having sign language interpreters at events, holding in-person meetings where access is easy for people of all. And Mary, I don't know if you can read the last sentence from there. Uh, of all abilities, having documents offered any more than one language. 
So again, it's ending with discussing people, um, access for people of all abilities and who speak different languages. So um, that was, it seemed like a theme for a lot of people wanting to enumerate all the ways they thought meetings could be more accessible. Policing, um, and again, this is, you know, we gave this directly to the Police Review Commission before bringing it to you all so that nothing, you know, I don't think there was any area where either of us were surprised each other or, you know, I hope we didn't surprise the um, police department. Um, you know, we <clears throat> wanted to be true to what we heard and in our notes we have um, we even went through and tabulated the number of times we might have seen a response like this because we wanted to be responsive to the police department, really wondering, you know, how, how many respondents wanted to decrease the number of police officers versus how many people want to see police officers more on the beat and out of, on bikes and out on, you know, so later we comment on the nature of, you know, the feedback being, um, are we rebooted? Okay. Um, pretty polarized and contradictory in this area, which is probably no surprise to you, but we wanted to, you know, really enumerate what we heard, which was there, this section had quite a few comments, probably um, upwards of 160 or 170 comments. Um, operationally, people wanted to see more of a mental health crisis response um, embedded in the police department um, to have more resources and options offered via dispatch, which of course, talking to dispatch, you know, when they have the time and capacity, they already try to do that is, is what we heard versus when they do have an emergency situation they're trying to respond to. So, you know, this, but that did come up quite a bit. Um, a quote here, have folks trained in social services to help provide guidance when dealing with crisis situations, restructure the police department, create a new community safety department. In so many words, we did hear that a lot in the comments. Um, improve representation training, accountability mechanisms, et cetera. Training um, and oversight, you know, probably came up, um, you know, just as much as change what the makeup of the police department. There was a lot of let's have better training and more engagement. Um, relational, lots of comments about police getting out of vehicles and being approachable. Um, here are some quotes. Each police officer needs to choose a community committee group project to work with people from marginalized identities so both can start building a relationship outside of biases and stereotypes. Another quote, walk around more often. Um, there was, you know, a lot of feedback about decreasing interactions with people from marginalized communities who may have a fear response and feel triggered. You know, I will say this is one area where even other emergency services staff, without hopefully trying to out them or create division in any way, would say that they had a hard time de-escalating in a situation where someone thought they were the police or that the police were on their way. So they, it was hard for them to do their job and deal with uh, de-escalation de-escalating a crisis situation when people were in a heightened state about fearing the police and the police being present or imminently present. Um, structurally, you know, and, and Sue and Tabitha probably have the numbers closer on hand than I do sitting here, but, you know, we heard various forms of, you know, less armed police officers, less police officers, less money going to police officers, and it going to other forms of public safety um, in, in pretty significant numbers. Probably overall, Matt, that, that number matched the number of people who said, we want to see more police officers and have them be very approachable and, you know, be, be engaged with our community. So we get that that's a real tension. Um, some quotes here, don't prepare for full battle 24 seven, the bulletproof vest guns, tasers and other weapons at the ready make a welcoming interaction difficult. Honestly, I'm just afraid of police, so there's not any way they could really make me feel welcome. Um, and then, you know, there are some situations where the police respond where it's out of their hands that they are being asked to respond. And this was a situation where people from marginalized identities felt that they had people in their neighborhood, their midst, who were weaponizing the police against them and calling the police on them at inappropriate times and that that made them, you know, far more um, in, in their minds, far more likely to be in an altercation that could end poorly for them because of weaponization by a neighbor or someone else in the community. Um, so that's what we heard from the community on this front. 
um, you know, what we kind of heard between the lines and we see as, as helpful ways to address some of the dynamics that we um, saw present in, in our conversations in the survey um, is trying to help make board and commission service more inclusive. Um, you know, this is a journey a lot of communities are on right now to really address, especially coming out of a pandemic where people's income got, you know, even more um, stratified that some people, maybe they have a master's degree, you know, have the ability to participate, to come to meetings, to um, leave their kids in, you know, with childcare, to get to a meeting and other people really lack that ability to participate as fully, especially when they might be called upon to serve. So being able to populate uh, boards and commissions with, with community volunteers might be easier with some form of compensation or additional financial support. Um, the, you know, a lot of staff members um, reported that they wanted to be doing um, deeper engagement with limited English proficiency households. That's what the LEP stands for up there. Um, and some, you know, had worked in other communities where they had done more of that. They knew what the protocol was. And there was, you know, a sense that there needed to be a more standard protocol, a language access plan, for example, to make sure that, um, you know, people were aware of the commonly spoken languages and what to do, who to call to get someone on the line that it was going to be okay with the city, it wouldn't break the budget, you know, whatever was needed to, to create a plan for how to support link, uh, limited English proficiency households. And finally, um, you know, we heard a lot of really positive feedback when people felt like a space was inviting or a staff person was inviting, you know, you have parks people who, who walk around and try to help people when they have questions about their trees in their yard. And, you know, you have a wastewater treatment facility that looks really cool and people take tours from around the state. And, you know, so when you have inviting space and your staff have the capacity to, you know, have those one-on-one -on -one interactions, it, it ends up going really positively. Um, it was our impression. It makes, it, it boosts staff morale. Um, they go to book clubs. You know, they feel good that people want to look at their facilities. And it sounds like you're on a journey to really increase the welcoming nature of more of your facilities, which we know is hard in historic buildings and communities, to make them more physically accessible to people um, in the disability community. Um, and, you know, to look at things like your website and the way you uh, orient external communication so that they all, you know, are kind of engaging best practices. Um, and universal design. Um, again, with policing, you know, we of course ran this through the police review division and the police department. Um, and what I what hasn't come up yet, but really came up quite a bit in the focus groups, is that um, there was clear lingering trauma from incidents involving use of force that may have resulted in injury or death. Um, and that, it, you know, this is my opinion, I hope my colleagues will back me up, was both for community members as well as for officers. Um, you know, <clears throat> even going back decades to being the one who might, you know, tell a, a <clears throat> auditorium full of school kids about an, an accident that occurred that involves someone's death can leave a lasting impact on that officer. And you know, making sure that they have support. It sounds like there's support for trauma fatigue, and you know, um, the, and there might be times when it's helpful to not have a city employee or a police officer be the one trying to facilitate a conversation between the community and the city about a kind of incident that occurred, so that they can really be receiving the feedback and and also taking care of themselves in that situation rather than. Kind of put on the the hot seat um so you know that lingering trauma still felt particularly unresolved um we you know really would encourage uh clarifying the roles and expectations of law enforcement it's really it, it takes those you know in leadership beyond law enforcement to say this is how you can expect to see them and this is what you just can't expect, you know, because they get a lot of expectations placed on them for when and where they can be visible. And it's hard for them to meet all of those and, you know, be engaged in that public discourse at the same time they're trying to keep the community safe. Um, as I said before, you know, it became really obvious to us as it may be, I, 
Sometimes consultants are really not telling you anything new, but you know, a lot of the feedback was very contradictory and polarized about what people wanted to see from the police department. And that is probably affecting you know, morale and their ability to respond in a way that really meets the needs of the community. That is um, an ongoing issue. And at the same time, what we heard underlying all of it was a desire to have trust and relationship that really cut across a lot of the polarization. I want to see and know these officers. Um, you know, I, I want to have that personal um, relationship and, and the ability to know who to reach out to and have a, a face to a badge. Um, so, you know, not sure exactly what you do with that. It's not just a barbecue, but, you know, there was a lot of actual feedback that we can share with you in some raw form about you know, maybe try to adopt a community group or something like that, that we tried to reflect back what we heard. Um, and just transparency, you know, that that definitely was an overarching theme that, you know, people, um, if, if the more the city's transparent about how policing operates and the changes that might occur to achieve 21st century policing, the less it falls on the officer to have to, you know, manage policy and procedural expectations in the moment. That is our presentation. Um, we, you know, have been asking these questions. Um, it, it, as we share the presentation, we don't necessarily expect you to answer them, but we just wanted you to see, you know, the ways that we've been making this the beginning of a conversation rather than a, any sort of final piece of a conversation, um, you know. And we, um, you know, have, we put out the report that you all have access to, as well as this presentation to everyone we spoke with, um, you know, and we, uh, we haven't heard that we were completely off base from anyone and anywhere, uh, you know, where people wanted deeper clarification, we can probably help you get that in the ways that we have access to the information in a raw form. Of course, the next questions to ask as a as a governing body are, you know, what creates some of those disparities that you saw in the raw data and, you know, also happy to help let, let you sift through all of the comments that were present. You know, some are um, really pointed and emotional, <clears throat> um, but it really was clear to us that the Montpelier community wants to be engaged in what the solutions look like for advancing equity in your great city. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is um, fascinating. As someone who loves data <laughs> and feels like I, you know, um, that all data tells a story, uh, that there's there's a lot of things that this data says, and it's, it's very interesting. And uh, it really does, for me at least, spark uh, a desire to dig in and know more and uh, find some answers. I also... Um, really appreciate the suggestions that were built into this as well because of course you know you see like these discrepancies and you're like oh my gosh what do we do how do we be better and um and some of that is some some of that may be contained in those suggestions but some of it actually probably a lot of it is stuff that we are or ideas that we're going to need to take more time to investigate and um and listen and um you know figure out a, a path forward uh, but at least this is uh, a, a great place to start. Um, so thank you. Um, so uh, I have one other question that's um, really for for Shana. Um, but before, well, actually, maybe I'll, because I <laughs> I called her out, maybe I'll I'll um, see if Shana. Uh, actually, I, I don't know. I assume Shana is still with us, but I wonder if we have to unmute yep. her. So maybe I'll maybe I'll hold off on my question for Shana before we um get to to public comment um but before that questions comments from council I, I oh, go ahead. one just uh, one, one question about just a, a data point that occurred to me was there any um <clears throat> data collected about the length of time any of the survey respondents had lived in the city any or of the survey responses had lived in in the community Oh, the respondents, how long right. they had lived in the community. Sorry, masks, I realized. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Here. Um, there was not a question about the length of time they had lived in the community. That That is that is an interesting one. Um, I guess when I think about 
living in the community and not the the time that came up the most was talking to city staff that may be no surprise to you but many of them said i've grown up around here i feel like a part of the community but i also feel priced out but i still love montpelier you know it's it's part of my upbringing and childhood they feel an affinity to montpelier but it was it was more city staff than anyone who said we we live right nearby in washington right. county i just you know and and part of it was just thinking like i, I know when i'm moved to New England, um, it felt like it took about a year before um, the Northern Hospitality warmed up. Mm. Um, but uh, I just wondered if there was any, because I could see it cutting in all kinds of different different directions, but it just struck me as yeah, I mean, possibly something. You, this brings up an interesting point for me, but I'm biased, and I don't know if, if Tabitha would add anything. She was present for the entire um, BIPOC affinity group, and you know she can speak to even just the byproduct of that group was people saying, I moved here during the pandemic. I didn't even know you all existed, you know, and other people saying I've lived here for 20 years. It's really nice to be able to welcome <laughs> you. I feel like I can, I have that sense of purpose. Tabitha, would you, would you add anything about that? Hi everyone. Tabitha here. Thanks, Keisha. Can you can't all hear me? Yeah, Tabitha. You can't hear me. Oh yeah. Just the speakers need to come on. I will. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Tabitha. Okay. So hi, everyone. Thanks, Keisha. Um, you know, to Keisha's point and Dan, to your point as well, yes, um, within the affinity group and even across other groups that we heard uh, where people of color were present, there was a feeling of I've lived here for a really long time or as for as long as I lived here, I still don't feel like I fit in or I still don't feel welcome uh, for a number of folks. So I really appreciate this question because we have people that are, you know, trying to move into Vermont of all races, but in this case, we're looking sometimes at race. Um, it becomes a question of, you know, how much of this is our kind of Northern culture, as you called it, and how much of it is this underlying current of, um, of racism and feeling not reflected. So I, I really appreciate your question, but that was one of the themes that came up uh, for people of color. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other comments from council? Including uh, Donna. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my question is likewise. I came here from the Midwest, and people were really cold in the 60s, let me tell you. And it took <laughs> years, years, and two kids in the school system. But one of the other things that I find that's contrasting is age. Did you take any data on age? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that because I feel like we, it's usually something we did at Tabitha. We did not. Okay. I'm pulling up the, the raw data now to take a look, and we did not pull age. Okay. We did try and really make an effort with youth and elders to make sure they felt invited or included in certain ways that the technology might otherwise not, you know, be supportive of. Um, so we, you know, really tried to ensure we had multi-generational voices. Um, we didn't I don't remember, um, Councillor Bate, if, if age came up in a way. Was there something where you felt like... Well, I just wondered, I mean, I'm in the generation where people were all in the closet, you know? And so I just wondered how many, you know, BIPAC people were older. Were they, are you talking about people in 20s, 30s, and 40s, which have a different relationship to their community than people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s? So I was just yeah, that's curious. That's a wonderful point. And I will tell you, um, <clears throat> sitting in the room and I would not pretend to know or guess anybody's ages. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that there was a range of, of ages. I'll tell you mine. I'm 43 and there were people on either side of me. Um, some saying, you know, very similar things and some saying, um, differences. So I'm glad that you mentioned, um, age again, um, with seniors, you know, having a different experience than, than people who are younger moving here. Um, with different expectations about what Vermont would have to offer. Thank you. Thank you. It's great, great information. Thank you, all of you. Other thoughts? Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you so much, Keisha and Tabitha and Sue and the whole team. Um, it's, I'm so excited because I've been the rep to the Social and Economic Justice Committee for several years and trying to do that work as volunteers without the training and expertise that you all have on how to do this work well and right. And I think even just coming in 
from outside of the community, but part of Vermont. And like, was it just so valuable to, to get that perspective? And I know we had a meeting this morning with the CJAC team talking about the next steps. And I don't know, Anne, what your question to Shana, but a lot of what we were talking about is, you know, how we can take the, the recommendations and really make an action plan, um, you know, and you know, to us, there was there is a longer term commitment of continuing the work, you know, hopefully with you all um, of uh, so some funding. And so and I think some of the recommendations would have budget implications, um, language <clears throat> access plans and stipends and some other things for us to consider. So we want to, you know, be able to bring that any ideas that would have budget implications to you all as soon as possible and working with city staff on estimates and then more policy things. And then, you know, obviously this raises so many other questions of like, where do we go and how do we, you know, work at addressing, but I'm just really grateful. I mean, having both, I think both the quantitative and qualitative information is just is really valuable. And so appreciate how many community members you were able to reach through the process and get, you know, a really wide variety of perspectives and, and really some information that, you know, it's clear even from the data that, you know, we knew we're not hearing from everyone. And that was a big part of why we initiated this. So just being able to bring voices into tonight and then for our ongoing processes. So just, just grateful and excited to keep it going. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if, if Bill and Cameron would agree, but it really felt like it, this, the city staff were so eager to have this conversation and know how they could do better. You know, everyone from street maintenance to communications to senior center said, we just, we just want to know what is, what, how do we see and touch equity in our work and how do we implement that? And it led to some great discussions. And so it felt like city staff, it already, the byproduct was this energy toward prioritizing this, more, which is really great. Keisha, I just want to go back for a moment because I didn't scroll over enough on the um, Excel spreadsheet. And so I'm glad that Sue is on the call too. Uh, who let me know that we did actually ask for age. So I have to apologize. Donna. It was 32% of respondents were 45 to 64, 34 were 65 or older, 2% were 18 to 24. You're going to have to do that again. You're too fast for me. Okay, I, right absolutely. Exactly. Put it in the chat. I, I was going to say, I'll put it right in the chat right now too. So okay. it's 32% uh, uh, were 45 to 64. Um, 30, was that 4%? were 65 and older and 2% were 18 to 24. Any discrepancies are people who chose not to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And then there was probably, there was a, the, the remainder were between like 24 and 45 or what, what was it? They, they were like young adults. That's a pretty good spread actually. Um, yes, very impressive. Yeah, I would have been mad at us if we didn't ask age because I feel like we, we ask it every time. I know, I was like, well, how, where is it? why is it not showing up on the tab? Because <laughs> we didn't scroll over all the way. So I apologize for that uh, mistake. But in the BIPOC group, like I said, there was a very, uh, very wide age range. It was actually a very fascinating experience to watch people one of the things we'll often do when we're in room with each other is just breathe for the fact that we're not the only one, but then we start to create these uh, new affinity networks. And that was one of the things that came out of that, that was incredibly powerful. So people were willing and, and ready to create community. Oh, and man, 26, I'm, I'm sorry, 26% were 25 to 44. And I'm putting that all in the chat. Bill, did you want to say something? Uh, well, I was just going to respond to what Keisha had said and um, was actually going to say at the end. So I appreciate you saying that, that we, you know, she, they briefed uh, a preview of this with our leadership team um, you know, a month ago, maybe. And it was um, very, you know, I mean, like it was informative and we all wished the results were different, but I think everyone really took it from the perspective of learning and wanting to, to grow from it and, and gain them. And I'm pleased to hear that in the groups, you know, that, that you talked with of other staff that you were getting that same feedback. So it's great. And, and we welcome this um, report and, and we're anxious to take it on. Uh, kind of good. Yeah, thanks so much, Keisha. It's like, it's funny, like when you read this, your instinct is to be like defensive, right? Totally. Which is, <laughs> um, you know, that's part of the problem. Right, right. <laughs> so um, I, I was just wondering, did you 
gauge the three labor unions we have for the city at all, because I do think the unions can be a strong force for internal change with contract negotiations yeah. and just communication internally. So I didn't know if they were like part of the stakeholders. We took the lead from the city in terms of how they wanted to organize meetings with city staff, um, you know, just not, not you know, having the context for what would feel productive or helpful. Um, obviously, you know, would, would welcome that input and conversation, um, you know, but it felt like, I mean, with about 50 staff total that we talked to, my sense is that a lot of leaders within the more organized parts right. of the staff were present, um, but didn't necessarily identify us so or speak directly to how they would, they would want to include this in negotiations. Sure. Thanks. So, Connor, if I could speak to that too quickly, you know, I guess um, when we when we are generally doing our business, you know, I, I think there's really not people don't necessarily think of themselves as a union or non-union. I mean, we really try to work as a team. Obviously, when we're bargaining and things come up that are related that way, but the the folks they met with, police officers, firefighters, first responders, they're almost 100% unionized. The DPW people. So, I think. They out of the fifty folks you met, I would guess they, you know, I think we're about two thirds or three quarter unionized, something like that. So they probably got a representative sample of that. Yeah. So my question for Shana, it was really uh, pertaining to what Lauren uh, alluded to. What one of the uh, there, were, there were multiple reasons why we wanted to pursue this uh, this report. But one of them was really at the request of the uh, Social and Economic Justice Committee uh, as a place to start their work. And so I just wanted to check in with Shana to see, you know, um, how, I, and maybe Lauren has sort of already spoken to this, but anything you want to add to that about how um, CJAC at this point is is thinking about this report as a starting place, you know, are, are there some good next steps? Um, I mean, I, I certainly wrote down some of the suggestions from the, the report uh, now that I, I think we could start working on immediately, but, um, but there, there may be more. Uh, so yeah, I'm curious for your thoughts, Shana. Thanks, yeah. So yeah, I think our next steps here need to be, you know, I, so there's a couple of, you know, ease, you know, not easy, but like, easily implementable things that can be done that are being recommended here. And I think that those need to be driven forward by the city council and by city staff, you know, both through an ongoing investment for consultants to be able to push this work forward, not having this be, you know, run by, by volunteers and through budget items for the actual implementation. And that CJAC can sub provide significant support for this work, you know, by providing accountability of checking in quarterly to assess progress and to hold council and staff kind of accountable to this implementation um, and to continue to participate and to deeply engage in the process and continue proactive engagement. But that ultimately this work does need to be um, uh, integrated kind of throughout all of the different kind of programs and services um, of the city and so of, of needing it to be, um, you know, really led and driven by by the city and staff, uh, by council and staff. Anything else to add, um, Lauren, too? Sorry, not to call on you now, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that's a great summary. I think the, the committee seemed this morning at our meeting, you know, excited to kind of lay out that plan. Like there's the short term, immediately implementable things that obviously identify issues that we need to dig into more. There's, you know, kind of a host of different um, ways that we can respond. And, you know, some take budget um, investments, some don't necessarily, you know, they would take staff time and focus. And so I think we were talking about both just making it clear what what we can do so that, you know, council is clear. So staff are clear of like, what are we, what are we calling for? You know, taking these recommendations into like the next level of detail. Um, and then, you know, again, like I said, the, I, th I think Shana said it well of like keeping on it of like making sure that this remains, you know, a high priority and something that we're thinking about and doing in all of our work. Um, one other thing just that had come to mind when Shana was talking, we had, 
I know I'd mentioned it a while ago, but we had this really great meeting because there's there's city staff doing all of this work. There's council, and then there's we have so many volunteer committees as well. Um, you know, we've heard from the homelessness task force tonight, the parks commission. They're they're you know elected, but but we have all of these groups of community members doing work. We had a great initial meeting talking about equity issues, and I think that group as well is another. We've been talking about partnerships with um, with those groups and how we're also rolling this out. So it's happening, you know, in a lot of different ways that the city is doing work and that community members are doing work. So that was another space that we had identified of, of bringing, bringing this report and recommendations and the next steps too. Great. Um, any other comments from council? Um, I, I have one and yeah. it, it, recommendations are wonderful and everything that Lauren and others have said about the next steps. I need just one more thing. And it's, I want to meet with the people you met with. I want us to have a community event that are, that are many more than one, that we bring people together of all sorts of different backgrounds so that we're getting to know one another. So I, as a counselor, will hear from them or walking down the street, I can talk to them. And, and they, likewise, I really crave that, um, that interface with the community and all, because this is all about the city and this is great. Policies will make a difference, but I think we can grease the wheels much quicker if we also simultaneously start having community gatherings and that having help from people like yourselves as facilitators. Is there any way that that's part of your recommendations that's just not here? Or is that another step that we would have to do like an RFP for? Right. I, I love um, your enthusiasm. And I think one of the other really important points that came from this, especially from BIPOC respondents, is that they're fatigued. They're fatigued with telling their stories. They're fatigued with coming to the table and not seeing action. So our recommendation, and Sue and Keisha, certainly feel free to add to this or you know um, whatever you think. Um, our recommendation would be to start to form relationships and go to where people are. So for example, if you know that there is um, an upcoming arts event where people of color um, might be, you know, like if it's showcasing an artist of color, there's a likelihood that we're going to show up there. So to start to get out there and to create those kinds of relationships that will allow, you know, you to have that access. So when something happens, somebody will call you directly. That's really where I think that, you know, as, um, as, uh, as a governing body that can be super helpful for you. Um, you know, you could try to host events, but oftentimes again, people are, are quite exhausted. Um, <clears throat> So get out there, do those relationships, go to the places where you're going to find, you know, uh, your communities, your restaurants, you know, where we are and, and you'll find us. <laughs> well, and likewise, and I wasn't necessarily thinking of wow. quote intellectual workshops and I may have used right. that word, but you know, fun community events where you bring all sorts together and you share a project. Um, right. But you were very helpful. That those are yeah. helpful, helpful hints. Thank you. Listen, I'll come down for a fondue night any night. Just let me know okay. when you have it. I will make the trip. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, the high school had a meal um, a, a few years back because the students were into some cultural exchanges, and it was wonderful. Uh, all right. So um, I, at this point, if we have any further comments or questions from the public, um, now would be an okay time for that. I think Joe Tabitha, you're... Yeah, what's up, John? Stretched out. Oh, 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 sure, sure. Trapped yeah, inside a Japanese I've, guitar. I'm so sorry, Tabitha. <laughs> I feel like it's, uh, it's going to take her a minute to yes. for the Wi-Fi to catch up. Sorry, Tabitha. If you if you were saying something to us, we did not catch it. I'm sorry. Uh, would you? Uh, it looks like maybe your internet is more stable now. Um, do you want to try? It still seems frozen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Chat and and I will say it out loud. Okay. Yes. Put it in the chat. That's a great idea. Um, I'm gonna go John and then uh, Peter. Uh, Thanks, and I hope you all bear with me for a moment. I uh, my office is sited in here. 
and it's a public meeting. So I, and I am an elected official, so I feel like I should give a response and to, to coin a phrase, I, I hope you all will appreciate that, uh, I need to, uh, speak my truth and it's not a comment on how anyone else is feeling or responding or reacting. Uh, personally, uh, I'm not excited. Uh, I'm looking at this and I'm finding out that one out of four BIPOC people who come into my office never feel valued. That's extraordinary. Uh, rather than feeling excited by the information, it strikes me as more going to the doctor and finding out that you have a chronic condition, uh, which racism is a chronic condition. And it's not a chronic condition like um, eczema, not to put down eczema or make people feel bad about eczema. Or, it's cancer. It's fatal. It's fatal. It's terminal. There is a terminal illness in my office and there is no other way I can look at it. There's, there's a lot of explanations. I might be able to come up with it for, to soften it, um, but they don't matter because I have to assume the worst. Um, I think like any terminal illness, you commit to doing whatever it takes to get over it. I don't know what that is, but I'll find out. And whatever it is, I will do it. I may never close that gap, but I'm going to assume that I can. But um, it's it's this is hard to look at. I uh, I feel no excitement whatsoever. But anyways, my uh, very sincere apology, and we will uh, see what we can do. Well. If I may, John, first of all, I think that was really honest and courageous um, and helpful to the conversation to say that and not to absolve you of blame in any way, um, but to broaden out, you know, and recognize that law enforcement actors have had to acknowledge that they are still operating in a system that was built and designed, you know, with some of our original sins as a nation baked in of, you know, bringing back fugitive <clears throat> slaves and keeping people segregated rather than helping to make an inclusive, safe community. And law enforcement lives with that legacy and works to dismantle it every day. Clerk's offices and any system in government is not immune from, you know, a history of who gets to access land records, who owns property, you know, who feels welcome in spaces that were not created or designed for them. So as you work with your team and your processes to, you know, dismantle any of those feelings of being disconnected or, or devalued, you know, also know that you're battling centuries of policies and systems that were not designed to uplift and enhance the lives of people of color and other marginalized communities. And so, you know, it is a chronic condition and one that, you know, is generational in many ways as well. Well, thank you for saying that. And I hear you. I appreciate what you're saying. I don't think it takes one ounce of pressure off. <laughs> Good. Nothing. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Bill. I, I, know, I know Peter's waiting, but I actually had a follow on it because, you know, we talked about this when we saw the first thing. And I just... Again, I'm going to try to take a little heat off you too. I wonder, you know, I noticed, well, I'm not. Don't take you know, the heat all, off. We all want to make the changes. I, I think my question, and I don't know if you have any way of knowing it, you know, there was a city council section and a city clerk section, but nothing about the city manager or planning. Or anything. And I'm wondering how much people are, you know, we understand the distinctions, but I'm wondering how much the city clerk was sort of a, stand in for coming to city hall mm -hmm. and it wasn't just the clerk's office it was all of us that people felt like they had trouble with the permit you know offices or that they you know because frankly we deal with more sort of controversial issues than the clerk's office does and you know i going in so i i would i was more surprised by that and it occurred to me that maybe it wasn't simply the clerk and i you know so I, I feel the same way as John, you know, we, we have to be better. And I, and I, 
that, that that's it's more of a standard for all of us. There's going to be many ways to get more granular with the data, and at the same time hold that you know you you're you're thinking about it as a sort of user experience. You know, it could be a number of things that they're reacting to that you want to better understand, um, but they're never going to fully understand all the nuanced differences between who they're interacting with in city government. Um, you know, and so it's really worth making a going deeper into, you know, all of it. Um, but it, it could be the website, you know, we, we don't know in terms of if they're interacting with a human and feeling that way or not. Um, and back to, you know, Donna's call to action to have some kind of, um, meeting or series of meetings, you know, we love a good summit and the ability for people to say, you know, to, to go deeper and ask more questions and hear from each other's lived experiences and, you know, come up with more durable solutions and diagnoses um, from there. But I think it's really good to stay in the, in the space of trying to build relationship to better understand what's going on for people than to have, you know, an action plan in mind that's built on some idea that like everyone in the clerk's office needs to smile more or something like that. You know, it's, it's going to be, uh, it should, it should it, in, enrich the conversation into asking more questions. I think. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Peter Kalman. Uh, uh, as a lifelong educator, I feel I need to observe something which um, is that, Almost all of the recommendations are what I would call universal design. They will help everyone, not just people of color, not just people of different sexual orientation. They will, they will improve our town. I, and, and so I was very pleased to see that because universal design has proven again and again and again, if you design something for a problem that you see, the chances are that that problem is a systemic problem and that it affects everyone. Thank you, Peter. Other comments from the public? Okay, uh, now it's okay to do that. Um, yeah, can we, is that, a, is that yeah. okay? Yeah. I don't need the camera, you all can hear me. I the think people at home need to hear you. It's the microphone, yeah. So I applaud the work that and the mission that was uh, motivated to retain the assistance. Uh, I, I like the word that you used, diagnosis. I called it either that or an assessment. But to reveal or highlight the these unhealthy divides, um, I recommend that this, the council consider an ongoing retainer engagement with this kind of work. This is not a one and done uh, situation or gobs of work to do um, in honor of, I want to distinguish a couple, uh, but in honor of Mark Johnson, the mentally emotional crisis category versus the, the well adjusted or medicated, uh, there's a divide. Um, the invisible, the unhoused, the dirt poor that I, I deal with many, almost every day versus the indifferent and the well-off and the callous indifference to what those people are living every day. Um, the parking garages versus the not ever, you know, uh, that's, that's a divide that there's, two variations of the truth out there that, that, that are still hanging fire, you know, that need to be addressed. Uh, who, who, who's misrepresenting the facts of what went on there? Um, the not listened to fatigue. You hear me complain about that a lot. I shouldn't have to bring up the same issues five, six years in a row when you're dealing with public works investments, but you got to divide Oh, the city staff family, the inside family of city staff and pensioners versus the paying victims and beneficiaries, which is all the rest of us. You know, that, that's, a, that's one of the divides. Um, but the, uh, the flatlanders and the woodchucks, uh, 
in any case, I would encourage further work on this um, as as soon as possible. But focus on the some of the highlighted ones I brought to your attention. Thank you. Um, other comments from the public. Okay. All right. Well, um, at this point, I think we can probably move on. Thank you so much, Keisha. This has been wonderful. Um, I, I, I agree. It's hard to hear, uh, but really deeply important and uh, a good a good springboard for action. So thank you again, and uh, mm -hmm. sorry for the late Just hour. To that last point, I think the intent is to continue this work over the next couple of years. I mean that that that's so, our. I mean, we're planning to fund it. Right? Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll just say that's you know certainly our intent as well. We highlighted two of the five goals we had originally um, enumerated with the city in the in this agreement, acknowledging you know the phasing of the work. We wish you all the best until we engage with you next. And uh, good luck with the rest of your evening. It is no easy task to, to do the work of a city or town. And I really appreciate everything you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Keisha, congratulations. Go see my husband. All right. It is uh, a little after 9.45. We still have one other presentation for the evening. Um, which is for our net zero 2030 plan. Um, Jack, did you have a comment? Don't we also, don't we also have the traffic calming preservation? That is, oh, you were not here. We uh, bumped that. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, so team. No dissent here. Um, I just want to note, I mean, I know it is a little bit late, but I, I mean, I'm still in it. And I, I'm assuming uh, anybody else is not. What's that? In I'm in it to win it. You all in it still? We're, we're good? Woo hanging in there okay excellent um yeah, and the district three council. yes those should be relatively quick uh but i i do see uh kate stevenson is here with us vi virtually along with uh adam sherman um and i'm not sure who else um Benjamin Lake, it looks like. yeah so i i guess for now um just to intro this i will turn it over to uh kate anything you want to say to intro this Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So I just want to do a very quick introduction to the Net Zero Action Plan. Um, this is the culmination of work that the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee you know, has been working on for 10 years. It's in response to a resolution that the City Council passed in 2018 directing the city staff to put together a 10-year plan to look at how we would reach our net zero goal by 2030. And so we went through a process of putting out an RFP. We engaged VEIC as our consulting partner to work with us on this project. And we've been working with them since January uh, to put together this report that they're going to present to you. Um, and I'm just really really pleased with how this has all come out. I think we have some very a clear path forward um, that you'll hear about and um, look forward to working with the city um, to, to put this plan into action over the next eight years. So I will hand it over to Adam and he can introduce his team and walk you through it. Actually, uh, um, thanks, Kate. Um, I'll immediately turn it over to my colleague, Kaylee Whitehouse, who will be leading the show tonight. So I will take myself, uh, I'll put myself on mute and... Uh... Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Um, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Kaylee Whitehouse. I'm a consultant with the EIC. Um, my colleagues, Adam Sherman, Ben Lake, and Dame Lane are also on the call tonight um, if we have any specific questions. Um, we appreciate being invited here tonight to present the findings of the Montpelier Net Zero Action Plan. This work is a result of collaboration between city staff, the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, and the EIC. In particular, we'd really like to thank Donna and Kate Stevenson for their continued support and guidance throughout this work. Um, Damon, are you sharing? Okay, great. Can you switch to the agenda slide, please? Perfect. 
So tonight we're going to try to keep things a little brief, recognizing it's late for everyone, but happy to answer questions as they come in. Um, we're going to talk about the background of the project, so provide an overview of the action plan document um, and kind of talk through some pieces of project scope. We're going to talk about some of the results, um, including the baseline assessment, our business as usual case, and kind of what the action analysis entailed. And then finally, we'll talk through the net zero action plan as it stands um, and what recommendations we have um, for electricity, thermal, and fleet priority actions. And then we should have some time for Q&A. So to begin, I think it's important to ground this presentation in our objectives, um, def definitions, and how the final report is organized. The purpose of this report is to outline the, a realistic pathway for the city of Montpelier to achieve net zero energy in city buildings and operations by 2030. What we mean by net zero in this context is to eliminate the use of fossil fuels or to offset the emissions through any continued fossil fuel use. This report has three main sections. So the Introduction um, includes the objectives, the definitions, the methods that were used throughout this analysis. Um, the results section includes the baseline energy use for 2020, including electricity, thermal, and transportation. It also includes the business as usual scenario. So basically what happens if the city of Montpelier takes no further actions um, towards this goal beyond what they're doing today. And then it includes the net zero scenario. So the, what the outcomes were of our action analysis and economic analysis on potential actions the city could take. The third section is the action plan, which outlines the recommended priority actions for electricity, thermal energy, and transportation. And so just to reiterate, this plan is not meant to be overly prescriptive as a document, but it's really helped to, meant to help inform decision-making and strategy to help the city achieve these ambitious goals. So in our work, we took a hard look at electricity, thermal energy, and fleet and heavy duty vehicles um, in city operations. So, more specifically for electricity, we examined utility data for 66 meters, generation data from eight meters. And I will also caveat that electricity was not really the main focus of our analysis. Uh, specifically, this was not prioritized as is expected that Green Mountain Power will reach 100% renewable energy supply within the time frame set out by the city. For thermal, we examined fuel usage in 24 buildings. For transportation, we looked at fuel usage across five city departments and also included data from school bus, the school bus fleet. Um, and the school bus fleet is currently oper owned and operated by a third party, but we wanted to include that as well. So before I jump into these results, I did want to note that the city has made a number of important investments in the past few years that have really helped set the stage. Um, and make this goal much more realistic. Um, progress has been made on the district heat, water resource recovery facility biogas project, the deployment of a few electric vehicles, and existing uh, heat pumps. On the electricity front, around 60% of the electricity the city uses is from solar energy. Also significantly, data has been compiled and tracked well by the Energy Advisory Committee, which really helped inform this report, but also will help moving forward and tracking uh, progress towards this goal. So to give you an idea of the starting point, rolled up the energy buildings used on an annual basis is around 31,000 gigajoules, and about 43% of that is renewable. On the transportation side, we are seeing around 6,800 gigajoules of electricity used annually with 3% coming from renewable resources. And when you look at these combined, you can see that the largest sources of energy consumption are at the water resource recovery facility by public works and the high school. 
Notably, the water resource recovery chart has changed drastically in 2021 because the biogas project um, has come online and you can see that the high blue chart um, there represents the now renewable portion of that um, piece. And so overall city operations in 2020 were around 36% renewable, not reflecting that biogas project. Next slide, Damon. Thanks. Next, our team looked at what the expectations might be now and in the future if no further actions were taken. As you can see, there is an increase in renewables in 2021, which we just talked about, reflecting the completion of the phase one biogas project and the elimination of oil fuel district heat for summertime domestic hot water by public works. This business as usual case also reflects the electricity supply becoming more renewable because of Green Mountain Power. Otherwise, there are minimal changes between now and 2030 that are expected. And with no further changes, the city operations could realistically expect to be 55% renewable by 2030. Great. So knowing that we need to find ways to reduce energy needs, electrify thermal loads and transportation or switch to alternative vehicles, um, our team identified a range of potential actions that the city could take to reduce this gap. So based on city needs, we assessed potential actions for their capital costs, available incentives, operating costs, viable replacement availability. So just the availability of say a replacement electric vehicle for an existing vehicle and the simple payback analysis. For electricity, our team did not really focus on this, but as the city has already made great strides on solar generation, the utility supply is expected to be renewable within the time frame. For thermal, our team assessed actions such as weatherization, ground source heat pumps, cold climate air source heat pumps, dry wood chip boilers, bulk wood pellet boilers. And on the fleet side, we looked at EVs, um, electric vehicles, supply equipment, um, by that I mean uh, electric charging stations and biofuel replacements. Next slide. Oh, and now I think I can hand it over to Damon to talk about which actions our team identified and the recommendations we made around priorities. Thanks, Kelly. And so the action plan for electricity is quicker because as we said, it was in a big focus and there's been great progress there, but we kept a few things in here could assess the opportunities for additions, additional solar generation, not because you'd be displacing fossil fuels, but because it's a good investment and it could provide some funds for other projects and could look at an opportunity to replace the diesel, diesel generators with batteries. Batteries have become much more cost-effective recently, but we realize the longer run times needed for some um, kind of emergency buildings uh, would still probably be a challenge, but as batteries continue to improve, there may be opportunities there. And then of course, continuing um, efficiency as buildings are, are changed or time of replacement. And the only other electricity thing we have noted in the plan is as electrification happens of heating and uh, particularly vehicles to be careful about not increasing demand charges and to, um, there will be a little bit more about um, coordinated charging on, the um, transportation slide. So for buildings and for transportation, we broke things into different priorities that represent how good, op how good of options are available today and how cost-effective they are. And those would be priority one. Things that are a little fuzzier, the markets are still developing or maybe they're marginal. Um, Cost effectiveness would be priority two and priority three tend to be things that are not cost effective as we see them today or things to kind of monitor. So with the buildings, the clearest opportunities are wood chip boilers at the high school and middle school. And as we saw earlier, those are places where a lot of fossil fuels still used. So those projects would make a lot of, pro uh, a lot of progress on the renewable percentage as would a, um, a pellet boiler at the water plant, not the wastewater plant, but the water plant. The priority two projects include a, a pellet boiler at the recreation center 
and the DPW garage and the air source heat pump at the maintenance shops. The priority three actions get at a small amount of remaining fossil fuel in buildings, at places that are either um, small and don't really have a, don't use enough energy to have a good payback. Or sometimes when sizing uh, wood heating systems, it's not cost effective to have them cover the, the highest peaks and fossil fuel is still used to do that. But when you're getting to 100% renewable, uh, you have to address those peaks um, in a way that's not fossil. So those would be some of the, the priority three actions. For transportation, there's similarly some, some clear options today and some more difficult things. The high mileage gas powered vehicles are cost effective to electrify now and there's plenty of options for those. So picking some of those highest mileage cars and getting them uh, charging stations, electrifying them, getting them charging stations are good priority one actions to do soon. But we also assumed that vehicles would be electrified at their natural replacement time. So this wouldn't really, um, it limits the, the cost impact and it wouldn't be all immediate. And you can see in this case, the priority one, we plan that over um, six years as opposed to just the first few years. Making sites EV ready uh, just makes sense. Anytime you're digging up the area around a building, that's a good time to be making it, uh, preparing for charging when you'll probably want that in the future. Working with Green Mountain Power on these plans to electrify the fleet because they have great rates and um, charging incentives for residential. But I would imagine that you know they offer the, offer the same kind of thing on a more kind of custom basis for a, a larger customer. But that's how you could work to reduce um, the impact of demand charges. We do recommend a, a switch to uh, B20 biodiesel. And a good way to do that is to work with other fleets, uh, fleet managers who are who are, ha or have already done that and can share their tips. And Green Map Power is one example fleet that's doing that. The main DOT is doing it and recommend it for their municipalities. So could be some things to be learned from them. And then one other idea here is to consider using used, uh, buying used electric vehicles. The electric vehicles um, used market is, is relatively cheap because electric vehicles are improving so quickly that even one that's three years old, the value may have dropped 50% because the new ones are just so much better. However, the, the market is devaluing them because they have low range. And the reason um, Montpelier can't cost effectively replace some of its cars is because some of them don't have enough use. And that's a great match for an EV that's cheap and doesn't have a lot of range. If you're not using a vehicle a lot, it doesn't justify a new one, but a used one could be a good option. The transportation didn't make it all the way to, uh, I forgot what the, the percentage was, but it, it doesn't end up being very, very renewable because there are not options today for things like street sweepers and dump trucks and sidewalk plows. But that's an area of active research and there's certainly prototypes of those being tested around. There, since there aren't, uh, they aren't available on the market and we can't get pricing, we couldn't include them in the plan, but we think that's, the, that's what um, DPW and others should be monitoring uh, throughout this time period. And we think things will be available by 2030, but just not enough to, to quantify. Uh, there may be additional options in fuel, such as renewable diesel, which unlike biodiesel doesn't require any operational changes. And we don't know if that's gonna cost more or less than regular diesel, but it may be an expense that you would compare to the cost of buying carbon offsets to get the, the last bit of, of the way there. So this is similar to the graph we saw earlier where we see the same jump in 2021, but we see a more aggressive um, increase in the renewable percentage and slight decrease in the total energy. And that gets to about 88% um, renewable in total. And the number I was looking for before is the vehicles only get to 28% because there's a lot of high, high diesel consumption, very powerful vehicles that don't yet have uh, electric options, but the buildings get much further and still have a little bit of 
leftover fossil fuel that things like the the school cafeterias are places we didn't or the school cooking energy is something we didn't um, assume a, an option for a renewable option at this point. So these options uh, getting the rest of the way that that additional 12%, they are limited in some cases by the availability of equipment that can perform the same functions, but sometimes by the simple payback requirement. And so to get there, get the rest of the way, it's watching for those additional vehicles and potentially having a discussion in the future of do we want to um, relax that co cost effectiveness requirement because we want to achieve this goal. And I think the conversation there is a good comparison between the offsets and whatever the machinery you're talking about. But of course, the offsets are just money that goes somewhere else, whereas equipment that you buy, if it's got marginal cost effectiveness, it may have other features or benefits that would be um, that could tip the scales in, in its direction. So this was a little bit lower than we, we were hoping for, but I think we can say this is a little bit conservative and, and we know that Montpelier could get to 88% renewable with things that are commercially available today and with things that are cost effective. So that that does feel pretty good. And, and I think we're fairly confident you could get further than that, but we just have to wait and see what happens uh, on the market for particularly large duty vehicles between, between now and then. I think that, I think that is it. Yeah, so any, any further questions? And we have uh, Kaylee and myself, but also our, Thermal expert Adam and our transportation expert Ben are also available. Great, thank you. Um, if you uh, go ahead and stop sharing your screen, then we can see you. Um, that would be great. Um, questions from council? Comments? Yes, Lauren, go ahead. Um, thank you all. I'm really excited by uh, seeing, yay, actions we can take. And I, I mean, I think given with current technology, I'm actually impressed that 88% without presuming like that the large, um, large fleet vehicles are going to, you know, evolve in the next five years, which I hope they do. And maybe there's going to be some massive federal investments and in technology and things. Um, that we wouldn't have anticipated a couple of years ago. Um, one thing I'm wondering about is, did anything jump out to you? So, you know, knowing that our state is actively working on a climate action plan, we set mandatory greenhouse gas emission reductions as a state, we set aside $250 million for climate action as a state, um, in the legislature this year, there's going to be, you know, unprecedented dollars to put towards these kinds of things. Part of what I'm wondering is, you know, are there, are there things that you would be encouraging us to be like pushing for incentive programs? Like you are assuming the existing incentive programs and not what might be coming with either um, incentives or like even bulk purchases, if a bunch of towns are doing things or you know some other opportunities that might be more cost saving and, and change some of those calculations. But just curious, you know, any opportunities you see where um, a city like ours could be partnering with other cities and or advocating to the climate council um, for certain types of incentives that would help us achieve this in the most kind of cost effective way for our community. Yeah, I think um, there are opportunities for those. And I think, as you know, they're not, uh, we don't know exactly what what type of funding is going to come and where, but the total investment, uh, capital cost, not in, not include, not the incremental cost, but the total investment, we think this, this plan would come up to somewhere around 5.8 million. And a big chunk of that is electric school buses that aren't actually within the capital spending of the city or the school department, but are under that contractor. But electric school buses are a place that, that's being heavily grant funded. And, and that's a place where a lot of funding could probably help in that. And that accounts for two and a half million of that 5.8 million. So that would be a big, a big help. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if any of our sector, sector folks have any other thoughts on an opportunity, those types of opportunities. 
I just Sorry, said what, what Ben told me to say earlier. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that five point eight million. That is an estimate for the the cost of just the transportation aspect or of the whole of all, of all of these changes. I'm imagining that all of these changes would be much more than that, but. You would think, but actually it was, it was a lower number than I thought too, but the 5.9 is for, for the total, including buildings. Buildings are a, a small 1.5 million. Wow. Jack. First off. I should say that I read this report and I thought it was great. You know, I, uh, <clears throat> as someone who, when I was doing public utility work, I was literally present at the creation of Efficiency Vermont and worked on making that happen. I think that this just uh, illustrates again, the high quality of the work that we always see from uh, from DEIC. And so that's one uh, one standout thing for me. Another standout uh, message from this is how great it was that the, uh, the environmental <clears throat> advocates were to, uh, to push for uh, renewable portfolio standards so that we could get uh, so much out of Green Mountain Power just because of what we have made Green Mountain Power do over the years in, in providing uh, energy, electricity from renewable energy. Um, it make, certainly makes it a lot easier for the city to, to get where we want to go. Um, I the question I have, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, may, maybe the easy, I don't know which one is easier, but uh, I, and I may be sort of ex exposing my ignorance here, but uh, I know, right, assume there's a difference, a distinction between not using, re between reducing and, and eventually eliminating uh, fossil fuels and getting to the point where we're not uh, adding carbon load to the atmosphere. And so, you know, is it a win if we're replacing uh, combustion of carbon, of fossil fuels with combustion of uh, wood pellets or wood chips, or are they both bad in terms of uh, carbon impacts? That's a great question. Um, I, can I take a stab at answering that? Um, advocates yeah. there. Um, so the wood chips, wood pellets are all a part of the short carbon cycle. So as long as they are renewably produced, so theoretically, as some trees are being harvested, more trees are growing up to take their place, then that is... Um, neutral now carbon neutral does that make sense mm -hmm. now to be fair that process is never quite fully neutral um but it's but it's better and so i think um more trees than we're burning in order to get right where we really want to be right so the sustainability of that wood is important for to answer that question but um and and again it's never quite exactly neutral but um but especially with the climate as it is, we're, we're saving it as a matter of degrees, uh, doing what we can. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, that's good. Thank I, you. Anything else that you would add to that team online? Is that a fair? Yeah, and I, think you, I think you answered it really, really well. Um, in Vermont, we harvest um, about half of what we grow annually. Um, so we have about 4.5 4 million acres of um, sustainably managed forest land, and we take half as much as we grow annually. And so that's a big piece of that equilibrium um, and maintaining that, that, that carbon balance. Oh, thanks. Um, the other question <coughs> has to do with, with transportation. And I know at this stage, we're talking about uh, municipal energy, but uh, we also have a city goal for uh, non-municipal energy, for total, total community energy. Um, and just thinking in terms of uh, car chargers, is there a, 
an analysis of how many car chargers chargers we could profitably add to to the city, not only for the uh, municipal vehicles but also for uh, privately owned vehicles. Thanks for that question. Um, that let's see the the community side of uh, the inventory work and the planning was. Um, was beyond the scope of what we were asked to do with this work. Uh, but I guess we did, we did address the municipal side of things and, and made some recommendations about specific locations for chargers that would be used by the city fleet. Um, but actually I would, I would suggest, um, you know, the, uh, another counselor had previously mentioned uh, all of the state and federal um, programs that are going on currently that are putting a lot of resources behind ways to potentially transition our, our energy system and our address climate concerns. And I think public charging is actually one of the areas, in addition to school buses, as, as Damon mentioned, that may see a big influx in um, re additional resources and planning behind it. So uh, I guess my suggestion would be to, to stay tuned on that and also um, Drive Electric Vermont, which uh, is a program that VIC administers, is another good resource for um, more community-wide uh, charging guidance. Thanks. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Uh, great presentation, folks. Uh, really enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I don't know even who I'm asking, but what level of engagement has the school board and district had on this? since they're a pretty big part of the equation with some of these items here. Are they at the table? Have they passed like a resolution committed to uh, 2030 at this point? Do we know? Um, I can speak to that last part of the question. Um, we did, so I was a part of a group of folks that asked them to make a, a net zero 2030 resolution. They said that sounds great, but we don't, uh, we want to work it out uh, with our committee. And so they, they have a, uh, I guess like a policy committee that was going, that they asked to take that up, but I, they have not uh, passed such a resolution yet. Um, and uh, do you do you all want to speak to the interaction with the board or staff at the school? I'll just say something quickly. So uh, you know, it, I think you you can see from the plan that that the school district is a key part of this action plan uh, between the high school, the middle school, and the school bus fleet, mm -hmm. um, and so. Even just today, in preparation for this presentation, you know, I did send the action plan to the school board members and the superintendent. Um, and Andrew La Rosa is the facilities director for the school district, and he was been our main point of contact through this planning process. So he was definitely involved in, um, you know, ad talking about the recommendations for the schools. But I think. Um, we could certainly use the city council and the public support in kind of helping to, to connect with the school district and encourage them to um, sign on to, to both the 2030 goal and, and the overall plan. That's a good question. Other, other questions? Um, so, uh, I also <clears throat> just uh, want, to, I want to thank you all again for this. I uh, I mean, this is one of the issues that I'm very passionate about. And uh, so, you know, I read through this and I, I'm so grateful for the concrete suggestions, things that we need to be pursuing and looking into. And so my head is already in next steps. Um, and one... <laughs> uh, I mean, one next step I could see would be to ask Donna or staff in general to come up with uh, an estimate for engineering studies <clears throat> for, say, a pellet system for the um, water treatment plant, uh, cold climate heat pumps for the um, uh, me mechanical spaces, uh, as well as, uh, for the, for the, or the pellet, uh, boiler for the garage. I mean, these are all very concrete things and having a clear direction is really helpful. So, uh, and I, I think to have estimates 
I mean, my, my understanding of the process would be we need an engineering study and then we would either build things into the budget or we go for a bond, particularly knowing that this is going to be um, cost effective and pay for itself over time. Uh, so one um, so one path forward I could see would be like, let's get let's get that ball rolling. Let's get some engineering studies. Let's see how much we think they'd cost and start thinking about them. Like how, maybe we can't put all the engineering studies into the next budget, but we could pick whatever ones make sense uh, for us to move forward with. I'm also tempted, in all honesty, with this estimate of the 5.8 million for the whole thing, which is sort of shocking to me, um, is to just say, you know, all of the, like oh, <laughs> $5.8 million worth of projects that are cost effective, uh, that are going to save the city and the school district money over time. What if we just had a bond for 1.8 million to implement all of these projects and just <laughs> just just start using that as a place to to um, to get running, um, and then I could see that pot of money also potentially being accessible. I don't know how we would. I'm making this up right now, but um, so Bill, you can tell me if this is not realistic. Uh, but like, if we had 1.8 million to implement this, uh, you know, this report. Um, obviously, the school district is a part of that. Perhaps some of that money could be accessible. Uh, to the school district for the projects identified here. Um, I think uh, having that money available would be, um, would go a long way for them, I think. Um, now, to be fair, I did not actually see the $5.8 million number in the report. Maybe I am mistaken uh, about that, but I just wanted to observe um, observe that. Maybe, uh, there, maybe there's a sum in here somewhere that I could um, do, but I did not find it. Um, anyway, those are my thoughts moving forward. Yes. Uh, I, I, I was also pleasantly surprised by the price tag. Um, I mean, one, one thought though, just knowing there is this state money and possibly infrastructure money coming in too, um, which, you know, a lot of it is exactly, it's like electric charger. It's, it's this kind of stuff that is like, you know, line item pieces, if, you know, if infrastructure moves forward, um, but some of those were even identified in the state, um, you know, American Rescue Plan Act dollars. I'm wondering about getting this into a tangible enough form, like having a conversation with, with some lawmakers of like what, like one idea I know that they were um, throwing around was, could they try to do some like local match opportunities um, using this for some of the climate dollars, for instance, where, you know, let's do a really favorable, like if the city would put in X amount, then we can, you know, triple it with the state um, ARPA dollars. So I just want to um, certainly explore whatever opportunities to take advantage of those pots of money as well. But I think it's like, what what's the work that needs to be done anyway of the engineering in the next phases to just know what we're talking about and have those solid estimates and like, maybe getting a sense in the short term from some state um, partners or lawmakers of like, what level of detail would you need to be able to pursue this? Is this kind of thing, the kind of thing that might be eligible um, just to ground truth that a little bit? Yeah, I could also picture just to build on that, if, if that's okay, I could picture having a large bond, uh, you know, 5.8 million or whatever, and then not necessarily needing to use all of it, right? Like if, if it needs a 10 or 20% match, uh, then it's available, uh, you know, when, when federal dollars become um, clear. Other thoughts? <laughs> Bill, you have a thought? <laughs> no? Okay. So, uh, well, I would simply, so, so I start by saying, first of all, thank you. This is a great report. And for someone who's not, you know, more of a generalist and an energy savant, um, this is what I've been looking for and our team's been looking for for a long time. And it really clearly laid out <clears throat> goals and timeframes and specific actions that we can take. And I think, especially on the city end, obviously I, I thought the way the vehicles were addressed was very realistic, um, you know, and, and we really, I think appreciated that, you know, our team is just getting this too. And we'll look at that. I mean, I, I, I love the, I, the, 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 you know, the big ideas. Um, I, you know, I don't know what it would take to design yet. I, my suggestion would be for now is that, you know, you sort of, accept or approve the report you're going to be doing strategic planning in a couple of weeks my hunch is this would end up as a top priority in your plan which gives us really quick clear direction and then we're coming into budget and we'd have 
in, in the meantime, looking for these other alternatives, but um, then we'd have a chance to sort of put some real numbers together. I, you know, 5.8 million, you're right, is actually pretty, pretty reasonable. We, we have to take a look, you know, some of it's water and sewer infrastructure. So that comes from those fees, some is tax. And, and I think that, you know, it would be great to engage the schools to um, just remind everyone that they're funded differently than, than we are and school funding brings with it state funding. So, you know, it actually costs our taxpayers less a, do a dollar for the school is less than a dollar for the city for, from the taxpayer. So if, if they're going to put their kind of investments in school buildings, it would really be better for the, the resident, the taxpayer to have it be in the school budget, not for us to, to raise it for them. Um, so, you know, hopefully we wouldn't have to sort of, him them the money. I mean, I just, but absolutely yeah. hope that they would be engaged with us. So, but the, then the interesting thing is if you start parsing that out, right, it's like how much of this is school and they're going to do that on their time, you know, their priorities, and then how much is water and sewer. And now you, you're talking about really manageable amounts in our, our funds for, for bonding. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and then we would prioritize those in our, our own budgets, you know, as we sit here, and I know this is a huge priority, but we, all, we also have a budget to do. So we, it's best to look at these with everything else and see where we place them. So I'd like to just, um, I'd like to just say thank you to the whole team. It was wonderful to work with BEIC. We learned an awful lot. I don't wanna forget Kate. Kate, you've been remarkable. You've taught me a lot. I look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues and um and um so congratulations for all that good work and um just this afternoon i had a meeting with bill and was saying that um a number of my special projects that i tackle are coming off my plate soon so now i know exactly what my next <laughs> plate full of activity is going to be and um, I think it's very exciting opportunity for us. Um, so, um, thank you all. Um, really appreciate that. And, um, people, um, that I work with that I never thought at the garage, for instance, who would be very excited by this, um, already have, have, um, been talking about what we can do and what they would like to do. And, so I think that we'll have um, some really good input um, that unexpectedly um, from my crew. Um, and I know we can be successful with it. So um, really appreciate it. Um, I have one further follow-up question. Just in terms of um, you know, the, these next steps, I mean, my understanding <clears throat> is that VIC, your your part in this is basically more or less done, right? You know, so as we're thinking about like, oh, do we parse out the school bits? Do we um, think about how to how to proceed with the uh, individual projects? Uh, you know, just even looking through the report, uh, I, my guess is that we could probably do that on our own if um, if we looked through it. You know, I'm looking at like page 29 has estimated capital expenses for each of the projects um, that are listed in table seven. My, is it safe to assume that if I, if I summed all of those uh, estimated capital expenses that we'd get to roughly 5.8, maybe not just from table seven, but from the whole thing. It should, but we, we should double check that because we actually only came up with the uh, the total total because we anticipated that might be a question. So that's a, a kind of new number for us to have the total, but we'll uh, we can add that. And I think we're we're also planning on having a, a slides or pages by um, kind of by department, and that might be a place to parse out the. Um, to put the capital cost by department, that might be a useful way to, to show it. Yeah, that would be helpful. And I'm also wondering about when you have estimated capital expenses, uh, the, I'm guessing that's just for the equipment. That's not like the engineering study that would necessarily go with it for, um, 
you know, the pellet burners or the wood chip burners, et cetera. Right. And they are, these are kind of planning estimates. Um, they're, they're used mainly to determine whether it's cost effective or not. And it, it's not as, yeah, not as detailed as you're, you're going to need to get for the actual implementation. Okay. okay. Uh, it's also important to note that a lot of projects, um, have very uh, site specific requirements. So like in general, putting in a wood chip system, sometimes you can shoehorn it into an existing boiler room. Sometimes you have to build a whole new, you know, boiler room to house the boilers and the fuel. Um, so that's a highly site specific cost that weren't baked into there. So um, I just want to make sure that those price tags that people don't think of them as like, Oh, well, this is what it costs. And, um, their, their, their planning purposes. They're not, you know, design engineering, um, site specific costs. Okay. Okay. And, and all those, those costs and analyses that, that we did are, are within the, the spreadsheet that we got from MIAC and where the energy data is tracked and we just added on to that. So we'll be giving that back. And so even if there's tables, we're going to try to, you know, give you a few more useful tables, but if there's tables that aren't made, that data is all going to be in there when, she, when we shape or form. And you can ask us, you know, we can tell you what tab or what cell it's on, you know, to go ahead, but you'll have it, have it all the, in all the scory detail. Awesome. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, any other comments, questions, thoughts from council or the public? Not that there's a ton of folks left here, but. <laughs> Do you need a motion to accept the report? Sure. I'll make it. That's it. And there's a second. Okay, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you again uh, for this. This is great work. Really uh, looking forward to taking some next steps with this. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So it's 1037. <laughs> okay. I've uh, got two more items that I think we can, we can do relatively quickly here. Uh, COVID mask wearing in city facilities. I will confess, this is an item that I had asked to put on the agenda because we are in a county that the CDC recommends uh, that we wear masks indoors. And so while we don't have the jurisdiction to ask the whole city to, to do that because that was contingent upon the state of emergency and the governor's um, provision along with that, uh, it nonetheless seemed like a good idea. We should at least talk about it uh, for city hall, for city, uh, city, maybe not just city hall, for city, city um, services. Thoughts. So just just as backup to that, that we have already issued a, a policy for staff um, with regard to inside buildings, um, and and to basically you know if you're in your own office that's fine, but if somebody comes in if you're more than six feet away if you're both vaccinated, and, but if you're not vaccinated you have to wear a mask all the time. Otherwise, the rest of us are supposed to be wearing masks probably right now, and uh, you know in the hallways and those kinds of things. So that that's art. So. I think that anything you would be doing would be deal would be taking it further to the the general public beyond what we've done. Thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm uh, I'm in favor of people being as safe as they possibly can be. Um, <clears throat> I I thought I read a, a disconnect between the rationale. Of uh, that's stated in the policy and the uh, and the action, since the uh, evidence in support of the rationale seems to be limited to the uh, need to have people who uh, are not vaccinated wear masks, and this obviously would apply to everybody. That is true. Other thoughts? Uh, Donna's got her hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Donna. Uh, I feel that the data shows that vaccinated people are just as susceptible to picking up the Delta when they're in a group in inside buildings. So I feel com more comfortable with just saying inside our city buildings that we um, 
require masks, and that would include city committees. Uh, Connor. No, I'm good with the big hypocrite now wearing a mask. But I will tomorrow, you know, when I come in. Uh, no, I, I think we'll be having to make some pretty tough decisions if this keeps getting out of control. So maybe a good incremental approach here. I was starting with setting an example at City Hall uh, is the way to go. And I think we do need to build trust with the public if we're ever to go into a lockdown situation again here. So this seems like a logical first step. Lauren, uh, I agree with that. I mean, one thing I was wondering, like I support this, I think reading it, it actually is, it conveys both because it says it helps prevent people who may unknowingly have the virus from transmitting it to others. So I think that would cover vaccinated and unvaccinated. So I think it reads fine. Um, I, I mean, I am wondering, you know, when we've talked about this over the past year and a half, we've talked a lot about, you know, we're trying to follow the science and public health experts and the CDC now is saying that counties like ours should be having requiring masks indoors. And I know that there's limitations on what we can do or certainly enforce. Like, I mean, should we do this and, and also be putting out public statements like we encourage you know, everyone in the community, we are, we are a seed, you know, in an area right now where the CDC, so when we are hitting that threshold, or um, I was almost wondering, like, if we should revisit, like, Montpelier Alive, like, you know, how are our businesses feeling about things? Are they, you know, part of, we'd been spurred to put the mask mandate before the state, in part, it was something our local businesses had asked for um, to keep everyone safe, so I was a little curious how they're feeling right now, um, you know, as we get towards fall and winter i agree that we might <laughs> be forced into more hard things so maybe maybe this phasing of tonight but it's just it could, seems like some good information and when we do if if you approve a mask mandate inside inside city buildings i think that's what you're talking about um we could simply announce that that's in place and that we encourage all you know businesses and other organizations to consider taking the same action given the you know, something like that, because it's really yeah. all we can do. Yeah. Um, you know, the only uh, amendment that I could see is that, I mean, that, I mean, my thinking around this was because the, the CDC is recommending this for our county, right? Uh, that we've, we're <laughs> above the threshold to, to have that be recommended by the CDC. And so the, the very last paragraph about effective period, um, I could see this saying um, the sort of shall remain in effect <clears throat> um, <laughs> until the Montpelier City Council or City Manager amends or send, suspends this order or until uh, the CDC recommendations no longer uh, recommend this. It's just a standard. It's yeah. Across the standard, it's on. And then we don't right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and, th- and that way, you know, if, if tomorrow we're in a better place, then it, it goes away. Um, but it just keeps us in line with the CDC. And we don't have to keep revisiting it necessarily. Um, so, yeah, that's the thought. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's, it's a good first step. I think it sets an example. But I do think it in how we communicate this, um, that it is important that we're um, – uh, encouraging people to wear to, you know, not requiring, we can't require, but encouraging people to wear masks indoors. And I think part of that too, and, and in my conversations with Montpelier are alive, but I think uh, is communicating to business old business owners that, that they are fully, you know, within their rights to require masks, similar to what, you know, the co-op just did. And I think they did a good job communicating and they gave, you know, a warning. They gave folks, Hey, starting next Monday, this is, this is what's going to happen. Um, and I do think that, that, that to know for business owners to know that they're supported by the city, I think is, is going to be really important because yeah, we may have a little bit of lull in the tourist season for a week or two, but you know, the number of folks coming from out of state is, uh, is only going to increase as we know. So I do think that that, uh, uh, is an important part of, of the outreach of, of, of this order. Right. Is there? I'll make a motion 
Yep. Go ahead, Donna. Now you, uh, you amended one section or, or did you not want to amend it? I, I would, I would recommend amending it. It's the effective period section, which is like the last part. Uh, I to, guess I'd like us to act on it officially. I like the, the yeah. way it is because we act officially to remove it versus some vaguely notice in the mail. I mean, in the news that CDC is doing such and such. Would you mind if we keep that in so we remove it? But I understand where you're going from. That's our guideline. Yeah, I guess I don't have super strong feelings about it. Other, do others? No, I, I, I. I prefer having the amendment in there because I think ultimately these type of mandates rise and fall on, uh, you know, the connection to the CDC and, you know, while we're driving it and enacting it on the CDC recommendation for these particular counties, um, you know, I, I think it should, it should lapse, not necessarily. I mean, we had that, that same, sort of hesitation when we, when we, uh, ended the last mass mandate. Um, and I think tying it to the CDC, you know, and making it a function, you know, I, I think we would acknowledge regardless of how it happened, we would acknowledge it at the city council or you all would acknowledge it at the city council <laughs> that it, that it happened. Um, we tied the last one to the governor and we didn't wait. No, well, that yes, was, we out, no, I understand that Donna. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that um, that was our authority to act upon it in the first place. We didn't say it, we would said it would end if the, if the governor suspended it and it would be one of those similar situations, which is if the CDC said we rec we no longer recommend masks for these type of counties and we met that criteria, It'd be the same thing as if the governor had rescinded the emergency order and right. we hadn't acted. Yep. Um, we just we also maintain the independence to act. So CDC may say, no, we still recommend masks, but we may say we no longer think that's really realistic for a number of other different reasons. Um, I think it gives us two ways to get out of this. Um, and so it doesn't tie us to simply our own whims. And, and that's what I guess I, I like about the uh, amendment um, to add to that. Okay. Um, I'll make the motion with the amendment. Okay. What's the word of the amendment? Yeah, I think it's... It, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, this order shall remain in effect uh, while the CDC recommends mask wearing indoors for our county? Or... Until the city council, <laughs> until the city, uh, Montpelier City Council or city manager amends, rescinds, or suspends this order. I'm, I'm good with that. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to propose something else, Jack, it's okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm a bit skeptical because of the or there, it's it's a little big, but I'm not going <laughs> to come up with something that captures what you're talking about any better. Fair enough. It's a policy. You can amend it any time. Yep. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, so, so Donna, that's, that's your motion. That, uh, yes. um, okay. That's fine. And, okay. And there's a second <clears throat> with uh, Dan. And so any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And oppose. All right. So that passes. Uh, and then the last item to the district three seat, Dan, I feel like I should turn it over to you first. Uh, I don't, um, have anything particular to say. I mean, okay. I've obviously, <laughs> I've given my, I gave my letter of resignation. So the timeline I think was basically this, which is last Monday, I was confirmed by the Burlington city council for the city attorney position, which um, as I think I've discussed with, with many of you, um, <laughs> you know, would prevent me from sitting continuing to sit as a city councilor. It's just it's it's not necessarily a conflict of interest, but there's certainly a strong appearance of a conflict of interest. And I think there's a logistical issue as well. 
in that we all have only so many stomachs for late night <laughs> municipal meetings, even those of us who might be considered gluttons. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, so I gave my, you know, so immediately the next day after that, I, I sent my notice to, to you and to, you know, city council um, that my intent to resign. My goal has always been to make sure that there's sort of a seamless transition between uh, my sitting here and my successor um, so that, you know, district three does not have a lapse in representation. Um, you know, as the bridge pointed out, it's been uh, a number of uh, city councilors from district three over the years, we seem to be the hot seat. Um, this seat in particular will, because of this now have had somebody stand for election in, uh, for consecutive years, which may be a, a municipal record, um, of, of opportunities to vote. So, you know, whoever ends up in this seat will have been thoroughly vetted by the voters. Um, so my goal, and I think the city's already given the notification that, uh, you know, with the 25 signatures um, to turn in their letter of intent in this 25 signature petition by, I think, the 20th, which would be Friday of this week, with the idea that next week you as a council would make a decision and presumably um, let them make their public plea for said position um, mm -hmm. as as I did uh, Oh, not so long ago. Um, and, and make the appointment with that person to take office then in September, uh, the beginning of the September meetings, which would be a strategic planning. I'd of course, my res resignation is, is effective the end of the August 25th meeting so that there was a crossover. And I certainly wouldn't be offended if you wanted me to step down at the end of that meeting, swear the new person in and, and go from there. Um, but at the same time, um, man, is it comfortable up here? Um, <laughs> and, uh, I think that's pretty much it other than, you know, I'll save my goodbyes for, for next week. I don't want to do it too many times or too early either. Cause who knows? So, so can I just weigh in on that? Sure. Now? Yeah. You know, Dan and I had been talking about this possibility <clears throat> and knowing that the confirmation was going to happen sort of between our council dates and that I was going to be away. We, we actually, we were prepped for for the announcement and and just held off until till the um, Burlington City Council made their confirmation and it was basically that was the plan to give people two weeks so the deadline this Friday so that you could make an appointment and and actually I was assuming if the person stayed they could be actually get sworn in at the end of the meeting you know after after the meeting mm -hmm. adjourned. If not, they could come in the next day and get sworn in so that they would be available. And that would give us a couple of weeks to work with them about orientation and just what's going on in time for strategic planning. But, uh, and, and we, I, with, and I did consult with the mayor, but really was, I made the call that in the last few times you've all required the signatures. So I just said, well, they probably will again. Uh, so we, we went with that. Um, obviously, you could waive that if you like. You could extend the time if you like. But we tried to set this up so that we weren't dependent on a decision tonight to keep things moving. Yeah, so thank you. Um, we uh, th So this is our, our first, I think, our first meeting since that decision was made, right? Since that Burlington yeah. City Council yeah. meeting. Um, so I certainly wanted to have a discussion with all of you about the process, um, moving forward. And, um, I know that the position is already posted. Um, so theoretically people could already have put their names in though. I haven't checked with you, John, if anyone has mm -hmm. yet. Um, but... I think it's going to go. Yeah. I mean, I'll check the signatures, Yeah, but it'll go to the city manager. Okay. Okay. No, we don't have any. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Jack. I think the process is fine. I think that uh, it's 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 completely logical, and I think the manager did a great thing to get it rolling. I I do think that uh, that we should ratify it because uh, there's nothing in the charter that makes it automatic that this is the process that's going to be. So uh, so I I move that uh, we ratify 
the process, or maybe it should be a phrase that I, I move that uh, to fill the uh, District 3 vacancy, we require applicants to submit an application supported by 25 signatures of voters in that, in that district by close of business on August 20th, and that we would uh, expect to make the appointment at the following council meeting. So that is the, that, oh, sorry, is there a second? Second. Okay, there's a second. Um, the timing is the question that I have um, because starting today, um, like let's say somebody hadn't heard that uh, this position was gonna be open and today being the first time we're talking about it publicly, doesn't give folks a whole lot of time between um, now and the 20th to to get the, well, to get the signatures, but also to make the decision that they might want to run. Um, and I, I realize that this might create a, a bit of a, p a potential gap, I guess, but um, one uh, alternative would be to say, um, cause it would be really great to have somebody in place by the September 8th meeting that's strategic planning. Um, but it would also be, it would be nice to have two weeks for folks to make the decision and get the signatures. Um, and so one start, starting today. And so one possibility is that, um, we don't have a meeting scheduled for September 1st, but, uh, we could have a special meeting, uh, where that is the sole, <laughs> or roughly the sole agenda item, um, so that that gives people more time to get their names in, or to, to make the decision, get the signatures and, and get them uh, reported and, uh, and then still have somebody in place by the time we get to strategic planning for September 8th. Um, totally works for me. Is, okay, I mean, I don't wanna <laughs> step on anybody's toes. Also, yeah, I mean- I just wanted to get something out to get Yeah, out. That's, that's fair. Other thoughts, and I'm happy to be wrong about this. <laughs> also, if people would like to go faster, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, uh, Connor, and then um, Donna, did you have? Yeah, so Connor, yeah, after Connor, I fine. No, that, that, I think that works for me too. And I, I like the idea of having a special meeting for it. I remember when we were appointing Jack's seat, it actually took us two meetings to do it. Uh, so it's going to take all the oxygen. At a, if, if it's competitive, it's going to take the oxygen of a meeting. So I think having the time to do it. Uh, the other, like trying to keep in mind the presentation we just heard, it might be good to run it by the Social Economic Justice Committee to see how we could get this out to underrepresented communities to make sure there's an awareness. And if, if folks do want to jump in for it, uh, it's, you know, not, not a terribly diverse council if you look around the room. Yeah. Uh, so that might be a good way to go. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Donna. Uh, my question was whether, Anne, you were saying that the applications were due next Wednesday and then the next Wednesday we make a decision. Or you're doing it all on the first. Uh, um, so just to clarify the timeline, because uh, applications are always due, what, like the Thursday? Are they, uh, well, the, or, so Jack's proposal was a Friday. Well, I think our thought was just, we, we picked a Friday just so you could have the names in advance. Obviously, John would need a day or two to check the signatures. Um, and if somebody didn't have them, we'd have to let you know. But, you know, usually so, 25, it's not, you know. Yeah, so instead of the council day to be Friday the 27th? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I, I, what I would suggest. Okay. For you, John. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, great. Um, other council thoughts or questions? So just so we're clear, so we just for, uh, so we'd be having a special meeting on September 1st solely for appointing. So and moved, Jack, you amended your motion? I moved to amend the motion to <laughs> set the dates as uh, the 27th and the 1st. And I'll sec my second is amended. Okay. Um, Peter, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad that you made that decision. Um, and I think you should take seriously what Connor just said um, and make an effort an affirmative effort to try to get to as many people as possible 
to get the word out. I, I think most people aren't even aware of this at this moment. And, uh, and particularly, you know, there are people who, who don't have the time or the inclination to stay up this late to listen to this meeting. <laughs> so I, I, giving us more time is great, but also figure out how to get the word out in District 3. And I think Dan and Jay, you guys have some responsibility to get that word out. Well, Peter, I'm going to push back on that because I did put the word out several times. It also went out on the uh, state news of WCAX with the initial announcement by the mayor of Burlington. So, you know, I, I mean, other I, than yeah, putting but, a I'm, semaphore tower up in my backyard, um, you know, I feel like we've we've made an I've made an effort to do so and to communicate that. I post on Front Porch Forum. I post on Facebook um, you know, I, I'm certainly supportive of what the council's doing, but, um, and I certainly support what Connor's proposing as well, but I, I guess I do want to push back a little bit on, on that idea that somehow this was uh, a silent message, um, but out in the middle of the night, which it wasn't. I didn't say that, Dan. I, I'm going back to what I said earlier. No, Peter, this is, we're, we're not really, uh, you know, having a, a back and forth. Okay, um, okay. But that, but he just made an allegation. I didn't say anything about silent in the middle of the night. I'm talking, I'm making an affirmative effort to get the word out in the district. You can use, we have can groups, get the word out in the district. Yep, Peter, thank you. Um, all right. So, um, uh, and just to, just in general, we usually don't, uh, have a, have a, a, it's not usually a dialogue. It's not, uh, you know, a, a back and forth. Um, so, but having said that we will try to get the word out. That is, um, a goal for sure. Um, we still need to vote. but we still need to vote. We need to vote twice. Um, so because there was an amendment, um, so, um, and a job will allow us a friendly amendment, won't he? But both parties agree. Okay, so friendly yeah, amendment. We don't we have to vote twice. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay, so. Um, yeah, yeah. I think so. There's uh, been a motion and a second. So the plan is the deadline for applications the 27th and then a special meeting on the 1st, which I assume would be at 6.30, regular time, regular place. Uh, okay. All in favor. Any, any further discussion? I know. I like that. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And, aye. Uh, and opposed. Okay. So, um, that passes. Great. Um, all right. Other business. Oh gosh, we made it team. It is 1103. <laughs> My gosh. Okay. Uh, council reports, Donna, can I start with you? I certainly may. Um, I was just wanted to bring note that being someone who is at remote meetings, the last two council meetings, it would really be helpful if all the council members had their own device so that they could appear on the screen with everyone else. Otherwise, you're not seen and heard necessarily when you talk. And it it's very difficult. I mentioned to Bill and thank you, Bill, and whoever you arranged it with to get the shared screen. Uh, last meeting in July, when the consult, when the presentation was done, you couldn't see it at all in the remote screen. It was a little teeny tiny box. So it really helped to have the presentation on the shared screen. We're just all working out the hybrid. So I'm just passing that on. Thank you. Thank you. Just if I can, worth mentioning uh, as someone who's been struggling, as Jack knows, with trying to get the sound, everybody having their own laptop is going to introduce so many opportunities for echoes and feedback and stuff. You all need to be very conscious of that. Yeah, you've got to mute and turn your mute. You got to mute and turn it off. I mean, I would advise, frankly, earbuds, stuff like that. For, mm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's going to I mean, be. I had mine on, on Zoom the whole time with mute. Like, yeah, as long as it's muted, everybody just has oh, to mute it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mute the volume down, so it's, I'm not getting Just there'll always be someone who doesn't. So. <laughs> yeah. And we'll come after them. Okay, uh, Connor. Uh, uh, I'll pass. I think we can save maybe the accolades and roasting for Dan next meeting. That's because uh, <laughs> yeah. he's moving moving down to the minor leagues in Burlington. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, yeah, I'm going to pass too. Okay, Dan. Uh, why uh, stop a good patter? Um, I'll pass for tonight. <laughs> uh, Jack, I don't have anything that has to be said tonight. Okay, Lauren. 
I don't want to be a jerk. <laughs> One thing. Uh, <laughs> um, so just because the police review committee is we is taking longer, we want to make sure we get good feedback on the draft report. So our, we're hoping to present to council instead of like early September, like early October, and wanted to make sure that that was not a problem um, with the rest of the council. That's fine. Great. I will pass. Okay. I will also pass. John. I just want to say if anybody's still listening and was hoping to come to the square dance uh, this weekend that Nick Cherick and I have called time of death on it because of COVID, there will be no square dancing. Aww. Sorry. Another time. <laughs> Good to know. All right, Bill. I'm, I'm going to mostly pass it because I want to acknowledge that the one and only Mary Smith is at, at her first council meeting in person. Tonight. <laughs> And she certainly, <laughs> certainly picked a good one <laughs> to be here joining us. You got the, the full council experience tonight. So thank you, Mayor. Jack. One thing I should say before we leave is that we've had chat open uh, tonight in the, uh, in the meeting, which we don't usually do. And before whoever terminates the chat, the Zoom connection does, we should get all the contents of the chat out of it because that's part of the record of the meeting. Yep. And I don't know how to do that. But. Well, and I wanted some of those websites and they were hard to, I couldn't get them all up. So it'd be good to send out the websites from the consultant on the diverse, diversified report. Okay. All right. Well then I think that is it. So Without objection, uh, we will consider this meeting adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, all.